Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Dairy School Board. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So tonight we have one set of minutes to approve the public minutes from June 7th. So moved. Second. A uh, first by John and a second by Jessica. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Madam Chair, point of order to move the agenda item number 20, which is other business, to the second agenda item. Is there a second on that? A uh, first by Derek and a second by John. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Charlie, would you like to come up? Good evening. Charlie Foote, Derry Town Council. I am here on behalf of the Town Council to read a proclamation for Dr. Kokorian for her dedicated years of service to the town and to our students. Um, as you know, I've put quite a few kids through the system and still have some more in, so I'm very familiar with her and her work. So uh, we have a proclamation. And it reads, whereas in 1982, Marianne Cornish Gregorian graduated from Trinity College with her Bachelor's of Arts in English. And whereas in 1983, she moved to Fort Bragg, North Carolina and began her teaching career. While in North Carolina, she earned her master's education with a concentration in reading from Campbell University in 1985. And whereas Marianne's career began in the Derry School District as an elementary school teacher from 1986 to 1990. It was during that time she earned her Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study from Harvard University in Education Administration, Planning and Social Policy. And whereas, Marion's administrative career began in 1990 at Grinnell Elementary School as Assistant Principal and Special Education Team Leader. The following school year, she was the Assistant Principal at North Londonderry Elementary School, but returned to Derry as Principal of Grinnell Elementary School from 1980, uh, 1992 to 1997. And whereas, it was in September of 1997, she moved to West Running Brook Middle School as principal from 1997 to 2006, during which time she graduated in 2005 with a doctorate from Boston College in Educational Administration. And whereas, from 2006 to 2016, Dr. Kokorian was Assistant Superintendent of Derry Schools, and on July 1st, 2018, Mary became Superintendent of the Schools. And whereas, Dr. Marion Connors Kokorian has been the recipient of numerous awards, including West Running Brook Middle School of Excellence, uh, Who's Who Among American Women, induction to the Pinkerton Academy Hall of Fame, Middle School Principal of the Year in 2005, and member of Phi Delta Kappa, New England League of Middle Schools, Spotlight School for West Running Brook, and International Who's Who of Professional Management. And now, therefore, we, the Derry Town Council, hereby congratulate and thank you for your 36 years of dedicated service to the students, families, school board, and staff of the school district. We wish you a long, healthy, and well-deserved retirement. There's your question. So in case you haven't heard enough accolades tonight, the school board also has something to present for you. Thank you very much, Charlie, and the town council. Sorry, Erica. Thank you, Charlie. Is he already? Well, Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta go away from meeting. Thank you. So the school board also has something to present tonight. It is hard to find the perfect gift to thank someone who has dedicated 36 years of her life to helping students in Derry. She has been a teacher, building principal, administrator, and worked with students across the district and as superintendent visiting classroom, classrooms on a regular basis because as she always tells me, that was her favorite part of every day. Marianne loved to hear what students were learning and committed her time, passion, hard work, and talents to providing students with the best learning environment. So tonight, the school board presents eight books, one in each elementary school library, 
one at DEEP and one in each middle school with the following inscription on the opening pages. This book is donated in honor of Dr. Mary Ann Connors Gregorian's 36 years of valued service as an educator and superintendent of the Dairy Cooperative School District. The DEEP and elementary school book is The Giving Tree and the middle school book is Because of Mr. Terrupt. When students take out these books to read, they will be reminded of Mary Ann and all of the people who are dedicated to helping them learn, grow, and connect. Thank you, everyone. Now I know why my administrative assistant, Kathleen, asked me my favorite you can, uh, you <laughs> titles. Know, like. And I struggle with the middle school one because I used to read my so own two children middle school titles, yeah. but I didn't struggle with the elementary one at all. It was The Giving Tree by far. <laughs> so thank you so much to the board and to all of you here tonight and to all of you watching and those not watching as well, but particularly all of our students um, past and present. This means um, more than you know. So thanks again. Beautiful. And Kathleen did a marvelous job. Thank you. I have my own kids come and take those out someday. <laughs> At least I'll show them. I need to take a picture so they actually believe it. Yeah. They'll go, right, Mom? Thanks again. I'll deliver this. Okay. And thank you to our entire board. So before we... Well, they left another seat here for me. Now I know why you guys <laughs> left another seat so I could expand through the night. So the one other quick order of business I'd like to do before we move on is I would like a motion to move assurances from after the master plan to before it so that Kim Conant can present and answer any questions that come up. So moved. And second? Second. First by Brenda, second by Jessica. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. So I know there's been a lot of moving on this schedule, but from here on in, we will follow the schedule as is. So next up is personnel. Marianne? Okay. Thank you. I'm sure you never felt you'd get to agenda item two. Um, all right. Personnel this evening. So the first um, nomination this evening, actually under personnel, we asked to ask before the nominations begin, um, superintendent permission to hire and this is the first time I believe that I remember you've I've been asking for two permissions to hire one is from June 22nd through June 30th 2022 I ask that you give me permission to hire as superintendent of the Derrick Cooperative School District so moved a first by Jessica a second by Derek all in favor aye opposed motion carries thank you Beginning July 1st, 2022, I ask that you give Dr. Austin Garofalo permission to hire as the incoming superintendent of the Dairy Cooperative School District. So moved. First by Jessica, second by Derek. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And again, that permission to hire is typically during the summer, extended the summer months until we have regular meetings, and, and those goes typically through um, the second meeting in August just so we can get people on board before anyone else take, takes those employees. Okay, thank you. So the first nomination this evening is for Kelly Carey. And we'll invite Car Kelly up to the front, front and center Carey. Kelly? Um, Kelly is being nominated as the assistant principal of East Derry Memorial Elementary School. She is currently a teacher at Derry Village Elementary School. And Kelly, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I have been with Derry School District for 14 years as a classroom teacher, and I'm very excited to take this next step in my career. <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, and stay here at uh, East Derry with Mr. Fox. I'm very excited to get to know the East Derry families and students um, and get started. Um, I've been blessed to work with amazing people and families at Derry Village, and I just can't thank you enough for this opportunity. Okay, so I present Kelly Carey for nomination as the assistant principal of East Derry Memorial Elementary School. Motion to approve. Second. First by John, second by Brenda. All in favor? 
I oppose. Congratulations, Kelly. Thank you very much. And Bill, thank you for being here tonight, too. You make a great team. Thanks. Okay, the second nomination this evening is for Asanta Sunny Tornillo as the Assistant Director of Student Services, and that's a district-wide nomination. The third nomination is Angela Barber for a Science Specialist on a part-time basis. That's a, that's a district-wide nomination. And the fourth nomination this evening is for Mr. Dennis Mayo, Technology Education Teacher, Gilbert H. Hood Middle School. Motion to approve all three nominations. A first by John and a second by Brenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, thank you. And we have one resignation this evening. Allison Pongrace, Special Education Teacher, Dairy Village Elementary School. <laughs> Motion to approve the resignation. First by John, a second by Brenda. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We wish her the best of luck and we're sorry to see her go. That's it. Before, I apologize, I was not on. Before we move on, I just want to let people know we have a very packed agenda tonight, but we do recognize that there are two items that will probably generate a lot of questions. One of them being the facilities report and the other being the Pinkerton Academy tuition agreement update. So on both of those items, we will have time for audience questions after the agenda item. Other items, we will ask that you wait for discussions and individuals to keep the meeting flowing. But on those items, you will have a chance to speak right after. So with that, we will move on to the next item, which is the 21st Century, 21st Century Learning Community Corporation update. Joel? Here he's staying longer, so I'll take this seat. <laughs> well, this is quite a meeting to come to. I didn't know all this was going on. It's what I get for only coming to town twice a week. Congratulations. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> you know, I I'll tell you, my, each of my sons, Landon and Benjamin, will remember you forever as a teacher. Marilyn will remember you forever as an assistant principal and principal and teacher. And congratulations to you. Great career. Thanks, Joel. You have great memories with your family. Good. So here we are, 21st century again. We're here to hand. We're, we're, are we here to hand out money, or just talk about the great things we've done? Hand out. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some good things going on. As for just as a quick reminder, 21st century started out with a bunch of community leaders in the schools and other places that were just raising money for technology. We ended up with a bunch of money in an escrow account. We come back here hopefully a couple times a year and we hand out money and we fund projects that teachers or schools or other people need. You know, you go back to 1991, what we were trying to fund was these big old compact computers, right? <laughs> so things have changed and evolved, right? Now, I think most students now have a computer. So now what do you do? So um, we've come up with some great ideas and now we want to talk about what we're funding for this year. So I'll give it to Cliff. He had a great idea. So this is, a, this is this is the way computers are going. So as Joel did mention, all of our students already have computers, so buying equipment is kind of off the table. They also have Promethean boards, and the district has also been buying a lot of software for the teachers to use. But there are always uh, areas for niche software items that teachers need for their individual classrooms. And so we designed a grant process this year to provide funding for teachers or small teams to set to subscribe to approved online services to enhance their classroom instruction. Uh, it would include a two-year subscription with a maximum of $200 per year, and the winners would document how the program enhanced their classroom experience, and if it was uh, worth looking at, maybe building it into the budget to expand on that. So without further ado, I will announce we had um, five grant award winners, and those are uh, well, the first was a small team of deep teachers, Melissa Nickerson, Christine Arbor, Lauren Connors, Charlotte King. Uh, they all 
uh, put in the grant application to receive a subscription to Scholastic My Big World for the deep students. Now, it comes in mixed media. There's the little paper uh, thing that they get on a weekly or monthly basis, but there's an, also an, an online interactive component that they can do with their new iPads that we purchased for them this year as well. So they're, very, they're looking very forward to that. Um, and using it with the Promethean board as well. I think Melissa was showing me just the other day some of the things that they were doing already with the My Big World subscription on the Promethean boards. Mr. Douglas Boucher from West Running Brook uh, uh, will be receiving Formative. Uh, that's an uh, online application that um, allows more interactive slide presentations and, and uh, he works with math and they're gonna use it in their math classes. Sarah Ogden and Grinnell. Uh, braining camp. Um, I'm not really sure exactly what that one does uh, right off the top of my head, but it looked very interesting as I was reading through it. Aaron Kelly at Gilbert H. Hood, writing A to Z. We already use reading A to Z, but this is a, uh, for her uh, students to dig more in depth into their writing skills. And then finally, Cheyenne Murray at Gilbert H. Hood, storyboard that, using storyboards to tell um, to show their work and to present uh, their learning in that. So congratulations to all of these uh, grant winners for the 2022-2023 school year from the 21st Century Learning Community Corporation. I think that's right. <laughs> Anything else? No, I think that's it. That's right. great. First of all, congratulations to all of the um, persons and, and educators who were selected this year. Um, Cliff, thank you for all of your continuous work and, and your improvements, the improvements that you've made um, and, and going along with time and, and certainly improving the selection process and so forth. I think each year it improves and gets better. Um, it gets more efficient, which is what we're looking, simplistic and efficiency. Um, to Joel and Gordon and the rest of the um, Learning Community Corporation, much gratitude. You have been with us from the start I should say I've been with you from the start. Um, I remember our golf tournaments. Jane, you were, you were there too. It was really great to get out as a principal because we had half a day. And then we used to go to the Wyndham Country Club and help you out. Um, it was just so much, there was so much collaboration and camaraderie. And um, I really thank you back to the David Brown days, right? The yep. Superintendent David Brown. Right. Not Principal David Brown, Superintendent David Brown. And um, thank you for all you continue to do on behalf of our students you really have that care and concern um, and, and deep commitment to the students of Derry. And on behalf of all of us, that's who really, that's who we're about, why we're here. And we really thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all you do and, and the care that you have for um, not only our greater community, but most importantly for our students. So Great. thank you, Joel. We'll continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. We all know that education these days is very expensive and it's great that we have this, this program that allows us to have these extra things that we do not have to fund through our budget. So it appears tonight is Cliff's night because he has <laughs> the data governance plan update and then also the Parent Square communication system. There we go, yes. Um, as many of you know, about four or five years ago, RSA 18966 was passed, which improved uh, data security within our schools. And part of that law requires that the school board reapprove our data governance plan on a yearly basis. I have given you the updated plan. What I wanted to show you tonight and to the community were some of the security enhancements that we have done over the past couple of years to protect the students' data and our staff's data. Uh, one of the main things that we did, we, we moved all of our database services that include any student or staff data uh, into hosted cloud services and nothing is kept on our premise. While we have a very robust firewall and pr can protect our data, we find that it's much safer to be behind a corporate cloud who owns that data there. And, and so that was one of the things that we did to protect our data. Um, we've increased our management of our devices. We use a, a tool called Mosul Manager to manage all of our Mac appliances now. We 
taken away administrative privileges from all of our staff so that they have to be, any new software needs to be installed by the technology department. And the only reason to do that is not that we don't trust people, it's that viruses are installed. And so in order to keep viruses from being installed, we take away the inst installation privileges. So we have managed devices now that uh, all go through our management system, which offers uh, some end user protection as well. We've enhanced our pr password procedures to be um, much more complex, and there are absolutely no generic passwords out there to be used by multiple people. We've included multi-factor authentication, which means that if you log into uh, your Google account from another device, you will be given, you will have to supply a code from, that's delivered through email or text to, to you to be able to log into that device. That keeps other people from getting your password and logging into their device. <clears throat> We purchased a new firewall, which has allowed us, uh, the last point here, to create an accessible guest network. The reason why that's important is so that guests don't have to get on our network and that then they would be visible, or our devices would be visible to these guests. We can keep them in their own little space and provide them all of the internet access that they need. So these are some of the things that uh, aren't actually in the data governance uh, plan, but these are some security enhancements that I wanted to share with the board and that we are making a very safe and secure place here in Derry for all of our data. So that's all I have on that agenda item. Oh, I do need action on the data governance plan, though. Does anyone have any questions on the updated data governance plan? If not, I would welcome a motion to approve the updates. Move to approve the data governance plan. Can I have a second and then we'll, oh, okay. And is there any discussion or questions? If not, I, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, Cliff, for those updates. Thank you. Last thing anybody really wants to talk about is data security. <laughs> Well, if data security is not what people want to talk about, maybe they would rather talk about the Parent Square communication system. <laughs> I am very excited to present tonight Parent Square, which we're going to be launching in the next week. Uh, this is a new communication suite of, of programs that um, is going to expand beyond what we have right now. Right now, we use a program called Swift K12, which is, is what we send out those email, text, and phone alerts with. And it's a little bit limited in its scope, so we wanted to expand on that. And some of the features that Parent Square is going to offer us are the email, text, phone alerts, but also it contains an. This is an app-driven uh, application. You can download an app in, onto your phone, and the posts that the principal or the superintendent puts up there that would normally just go to email will also be contained in the app so that if you missed one you can scroll back through and see those posts and keep up with your information. It allows for direct messaging by the administrator or even teachers so there's another app out there called Remind where you can text back and forth and it hides your identities there well this will do it for us we don't have to subscribe to another service. Secure document delivery will be able to send home uh, grade reports and other secure documents electronically instead of printing everything out and filling up um, envelopes. I saw it at Gilbert Hood just today. All the paper we can save uh, by doing it electronically. This gives us the ability to do online permission forms that parents can sign electronically using just their phones. And so when you have a field trip permission or any other type of permission, uh, this can handle it. It's not on here. But if we do have another pandemic, there is also the health stuff that, was, that we wanted before. I know, we're crossing. Um, it's all in there as well. Uh, calendar integration. So if we have an event that we post out there, it can go on a calendar and people can just add it directly to their personal calendars to be reminded of those. There's a parent-teacher conference sign up so that you have one place to go and sign up for all your parent-teacher conferences when they come. And then finally, there's a teacher portal so that all of their announcements can be uh, placed on the teacher portal. So it, it really does enhance the, the, the home to school communication. It was built just specifically for educators. And we're, like I said, we're really excited about it. If you need to see some of what it does, Concord School uses this. Uh, I think Hudson School also uses this. And Pelham, I think, has also gone to Parent Square. 
but it's becoming quite popular in New Hampshire and we're really excited to move forward with this. I will be sending things out to parents beginning next week. We'll use the old system to make sure that we're getting everybody communicated with to communicate the new system with. So I wanted to bring it to you first. So I think it sounds great. I do have one question though. Certainly. I assume there will be some way for parents to communicate with schools if they do want, for instance, paper report cards or things if they're not as comfortable getting it through the app. Certainly, they can always contact their school office and request that something be sent in paper. I figured as much, but just for the parents listening who might not mm -hmm. access things that way, I wanted to make sure that was out there. What about training for parents who aren't, aren't comfortable using it or don't know where to start? That's well, a great we question, that? Brenda. Um, I have been working on a page for the website that has videos on it that shows exactly what to do, and the emails that they will be getting over the next week will also direct them to training resources that they can use to see how to do this. It's pretty easy, though. Just in case, mm -hmm. will there be an opportunity for like a workshop or something in, can, in a building if, 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 we, if the need is because that would be me, but you know, that's not everybody else here. So um, have, if, if there's a need, is will there be an opportunity for people? Certainly, I've always been willing to come to a PTA meeting or anything like that, that if, if anybody needs a demonstration and questions to be answered. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any questions? I don't have a question, but uh, I think this looks excellent and I'm a little jealous that you waited until my kid was out of eighth grade before you implemented this. <laughs> Thank you very much for your work on this. I think this will be really helpful to people. And it looks like you do not need any vote. This was just informational. No, it's just information, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you, Cliff, for all the work tonight. So our next agenda item tonight is assurances. So I would welcome up. Kim, do you want to be up there just for questions, or do you want to come up if there are questions? Yeah, I'll come up if there's questions. Okay. Erica is very familiar with assurances now, is all I can say, and so is Jonathan. <laughs> um, so in order to accept federal grant money, the general assurances must be reviewed by the board and reviewed and signed by the board chair and the superintendent. Erica Cohen, our board chair, Kim Conant, director of grants management, and I met on June 16, 2022, to review the assurances. The only remaining pages to be initialed and signed are pages 16 and 17, since these incorporate the school board meeting held this evening. Business Administrator Jane Samard, Kim Conan, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Austin Garofalo and I met to review the assurances prior to our meeting with the board chair. General assurances require everything federal and state that we have everything in place to operate a school system and accept federal funds. They include adult education, Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA, not ESSER, but ESSA. Food service, IDEA, auditing, drug-free drug -free workplace, and equitable services. Equitable services mean that we consult with Pinkerton Academy, who will be taking Title II and Title IV funds this year. Program assurances are for ESSA grants. That's Every Student Succeeds Act. These include title grants, specifically Title I, II, III, IV, and IDEA. Specifically, Title I, Part A means improving basic programs operated by local education agencies. Title II, Part A means supporting effective instruction state grants. Title III, Part A are for English Language Acqu Acquisition and Language Enhancement and Academic Achievement Act. IDE part, IDEA Part A, Individuals with Disability Education Act. So I wanted to be specific on those title grants. Erica Cohen as board chair signs the general assurances, yet does not sign the program assurances. When I sign program assurances, I am stating that I make the board aware of programs in which we participate, those programs that I just delineated tonight. GEPA, General Education Provisions Act. Hear that, Mr. Tripp? See, I'm identifying everything tonight. Are part of the program assurances requirements. 
Kim Conan is here to respond to any questions you may have about title grants or assurances at this time. We do need board action on this as well, I believe. So for the benefit of the public, as someone who this is, this is the second year I've done this, just for the benefit of the public, the important thing to know about is assurances are they're critical to running the district. And these are reviewing them in advance and presenting them in public assures us that we are following the federal rules for grants. And therefore, and this is critical, we will not have to pay the money back. So this is why these need to be reviewed by the board chair, whoever that person is, and why they then need to be approved in public. And just since we do a lot of things very administrative here, I wanted you to know just how important this particular item is. We do not want to be paying back grants that we receive. <laughs> so I did review all these. We spent over an hour and a half on it. So at this point, I would welcome a motion to approve the assurances unless if anyone does have questions, Kim Conant, our grants manager is here. She's very knowledgeable and was answering a lot of questions for me and she would happily answer them. Does anyone on the board have any questions for her? Motion to approve the fiscal year 2023 general assurances and program assurances for federal grants. Uh, first by Derek and a second by Brenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, Kim, for all your work on this and Mary Ann and John. <laughs> And Jane, it was a group effort. Jane and Samara Jane. did an incredible amount of work as well. I just don't want to leave you out, Jane. You did an incredible amount of work on this. Um, they, we probably had more meetings than Kim and Jane wanted to. You can nod your head. It's okay. Um, just to make sure we were through all the details. I just kept saying, can we have another meeting just to make sure we're in compliance? And um, I, I believe, just want to add that... Um, Title for a Title Four Part A student support and academic achievement grants as well. I want to make sure that you know that we accept money for that. So, um, but, you know, I credit Kim and Jane for doing an incredible amount of work on these and just keeping us in compliance. So, thank you, and Erica, thank you for taking the time that you did. And John, yes, for yes, sir. Okay. So our next ag agenda item tonight is facilities, and I just want to remind people today that tonight Eric from La Valley will be presenting along with Mark, who's the estimator for costs. They will pre be presenting the update on the facilities application for building aid for a new school. As a reminder, our district could get up to 45% of the project cost, not including deep in the new building because that is not eligible for building aid. The application is due July 1st, so this presentation is focused on that application. But later this evening, when we discuss the school board calendar, we'll also be discussing fitting in workshops for the entire board to come up with plans for repairs to all schools, kind of a plan B and also what we need to do regardless. Those meetings are open to the public as workshops, but the public cannot comment. They are meant to be work sessions. There will also be public sessions throughout the year to discuss our plans and finalize the plans and to get public questions and input. We are also working on the FAQs page, so I just wanted to introduce all those facts before we had the update. So with that, I will invite Eric and Mark up to present the update. And then after that, people can ask questions if they have them. Okay, thank you for having me again tonight. I'm probably a recognizable face by now. Uh, my name is Eric LeBlanc. I'm with La Valley Brensinger Architects. Um, I also have with me tonight Mark Jobin, um, who's been helping us assemble um, cost estimates for the new building um, and was really able to work with us very quickly to, to start rounding up some of those numbers for us. So I have a pretty simple and, um, and short agenda. Some of the slides are pretty information packed. Um, the first one is design updates, uh, just talking about the design concept and how that has progressed uh, in, the, in the last few weeks. We do have some slides on project costs. And if, you know, I'll run through those 
generally. Um, if there are any more specific questions, we're lucky to have Mark here with us to answer any of those questions. Um, and then the final piece, which is the state uh, building aid submission, is actually probably the most important piece for tonight, given that our deadline to submit this application is um, next Friday. So the first uh, agenda item is concept plans. It's as architects, this is the most exciting part for us. We get to share with you the ideas that are in our heads for for a new new uh, building concept. So. What you're seeing here is a, um, a site plan. Um, you'll recognize that this is the site of Derry Village. Um, part of the phasing for this project is that uh, the new school building would have to be built first. That would be the first step. Um, you'll see down by where the baseball fields are, that's the existing Derry Village building. So that building would be removed once the new building is built and then you could move the kids. So the way the site's working now is we actually use, reuse that existing drive um, at Derry Village now to access the rear of the site where the new building would be. Um, you enter on access with the building entry, so visitors actually see the building entry when they approach the site. We do have two separate drop-offs. So we have a bus drop-off as you're entering the site that turns left, and then you would have a car drop-off that actually goes on a one-way loop around the building that turns right. Um, and then there's opportunities for drop-off um, around the back of the building. We do have a separate drop-off for deep. So we have a deep wing on the north side of the site with a separate, separate drop-off for the deep students. We do show two parking lots in this concept. Um, I believe there's about 150 spaces total. Um, and we show new fields, of course, in the place of the current Dairy Village. So we show um, a middle school sized baseball field as well as an elementary sized field, um, as well as an under 12 soccer field. Um, we do think there are opportunities around the building for play space, playgrounds. So we, we do show those at different areas around the classrooms and for the gym. Um, we do have outdoor open space that we think there's good opportunities for some outdoor classrooms and outdoor learning. Um, and we also show some wetland mitigation areas to actually help deal with surface runoff for the new development on the site. Um, and also note that we did add a, an access drive, a one-way access drive that actually expands on an existing route um, on the site. So that's the route that you see connecting the south portion of the building and that would actually wrap around and connect up to the parking lots uh, up here. And that then cars could actually utilize the, um, the traffic light for West Running Brook as part of that. So to delve a little bit more into the plan, I won't get super specific with this, but um, the big red arrow is the entry to the new building. The way it's generally laid out is um, on the left side, you'll see the core spaces of the building. Um, those include the gymnasium and the cafeteria. Um, these are all one-story pieces. Um, and then on the right side, you see the learning spaces, um, which includes all your kindergarten classrooms, and that's the three-story piece. By doing this, that actually allows us to kind of separate the building into two halves, um, and we can have secure entry for those core pieces, which could be accessed by the public, um, and they could be kept separate from the academic areas. We also show a deep wing, so that's kind of a separate classroom wing that could be uh, removed if needed, if uh, the budget called for it. Um, as you're entry, entering the building, again, on your left would be the administrative spaces, some special ed offices, on the right would be nurse. And then each classroom, so each grade kind of has its own wing, um, and, it, and it, they will each have their own identity. So we've broken that into the two wings at the core, this yellow space, that actually stacks up through each floor. That's sort of like, it often is a music or an art or a flex space for the students. So you'll see that carry up through the levels. So one thing that's a little different about this plan is we have uh, the library and media center on the second floor. Um, those will be accessed by kindergarten and, and first grades. Um, and they can be on the second floor as long as they have their own separate egress, which they will in this concept. So if there were those students on the second floor in the event of, in the event of an emergency, they would be able to egress safely. Um, and again, we have more classrooms, very similar floor plan to the first floor. They stack up, 
each grade level has a resource room. Each grade level also has small group rooms, which was one of the requests um, as we were going through the program, realizing that that's what many of the buildings in uh, Derry don't currently have. All of each floor has a professional development staff space associated with it. And um, this floor in particular also has guidance. Um, the purple areas have some special ed spaces. Um, and in this case, that yellow area is actually a maker space, which was, again, another request when we were looking at visioning for this project. And then jumping up to the third floor. So again, you'll see those stacking classrooms. In this case, in that yellow center area, we have an art room. Um, and then again, special ed spaces, professional development, resource rooms, small group rooms on each wing. In this concept, we also did realize an opportunity for a basement, a mechanical basement. So we think there's a really good opportunity to put some of the mechanical equipment down there that serves the whole building. Where it's located, it's actually right below what I'm going to call the knuckle of the building, their three-story portion. And that's going to serve, that can go up the heart of the building and serve all of the spaces um, within. So project costs. I know everyone's excited to see this. We do have some preliminary numbers. Um, again, these are constantly in flux. There's a lot of things, as we know, going on with the economy currently. Um, we are aware that this project is, you know, a future project, and we wouldn't likely break ground for a couple of years. So that's all to say that there are a lot of pieces that go into this project estimate that you're seeing here. So when you combine all of those, we are at currently just at under $75 million. Um, but I just kind of want to take you through some of the pieces here. So the first one that you see, the $240,000, you are seeing upfront costs, some permitting fees, some legal, legal counsel fees, moving costs, wetlands mitigation. Two has all to do with site. So when we're looking at developing a new site, we do have to survey the site. We have to do geotechnical studies um, and traffic studies to figure out what traffic flows are going to be like on the site. Three, professional fees. So that's all about the design of the building. That's not just your architect, but that's your engineers, your acoustical engineers, your traffic engineers. Um, sometimes we bring on acoustic consultants with, uh, to look at the project with us, um, theater consultants if desired. Number four, independent consultants. So on these projects, um, we will do commissioning, which is really fine-tuning the mechanical systems of the building, um, inspections and testing of the concrete and of the mechanical systems, um, and then the owner's clerk of the works, who's really um, a representative for the owner on the site as it's being built. Um, number five, furniture, furnishings and equipment. So all the stuff that goes in the building, all the tables and chairs, all of the technology that goes in, all of the um, computer equipment, that's factored in there. Number six is probably what you're thinking of most of the time when you're looking at estimates. So that's your physical brick and mortar costs to the building. We did try to break this out. So you are seeing that first line, 6.01, um, the 42.5 million. That is for the main body of the K-12 school. We recognize that the deep portion is not eligible for state aid. So we did separate that in the second line, um, and we do have the opportunity to remove that piece um, if needed. But then also factored in there, we do have site development, um, the demo, uh, demoing Dairy Village, um, the field development and site development associated with that. And then even in that number six piece, we have some owner's contingency, so that's a little bit of extra money in the pot that as we're going through design, as we're looking at the building, it's available to us as, as flexible. And then number seven is um, mostly rebates, grants, and contingencies. So again, you'll see, you'll potentially have some uh, energy rebates come through for the new building. And then we have additional contingency um, that factors in two. So we're looking at almost $10 million in contingency, which is really healthy. Um, and that's how we're arriving at just under the 75 million. So I like this slide because it really helps kind of give you a good visual of where that, where that 75 million, how that breaks out. So again, how that new school breaks out, the 42 and a half million, the deep wing, um, which again could be removed from the project, 
the seven and a half million in site work, um, the field development in the place of the current Dairy Village building, um, all of the site work, and then of course demoing and abating um, Dairy Village School. And then again, we also added the little blurb on the bottom that talks about some of the other projects costs asso associated with testing, um, with designing and engineering, the furniture and equipment, um, and then again, that $9.8 million in project contingency, which again, we think is a good safe number to have at this point. So moving on from construction costs to um, the state building aid piece, um, LaValle has been working diligently um, to, to pull all these pieces, th pieces together and working very closely um, with, with the school's team to get all of the information we need. I'm thrilled to report that we've made a ton of progress here. You are seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of requirements, um, but you're also seeing a lot of completions and high percentages, high percentages associated with those. So I'll quickly take you through each one just to give you an update on where they are. The application form um, really is kind of the general application form. It summarizes each of the pieces therein, and we're really almost done with that. We're a good portion of the way through. Condition evaluation form, um, that runs down the existing conditions of Dairy Village and South Range. So we've tried to distill what the findings were in that initial facilities report that we did last year. Um, and that's part of that form. Um, a statement of assurance to maintain the facility. Um, Jeremy just handed this document to me as I walked in today. So I'm happy to say we're no longer at 50%. We're actually at like 99% for that. Um, number three, copy of the 20 year maintenance plan. Again, working closely with Jeremy and his team to make sure that the district has a maintenance plan for its buildings. Um, and basically what it's saying is we have a plan to maintain our existing buildings as well as the new building, and that's complete. Uh, number four, school board meeting minutes to put forth for voter consideration. Hoping to get that done um, tonight. Um, it does say minutes must identify total project costs. I think there's some flexibility. We just want to try to keep it open as much as we can um, when we're making that move. Um, 05 recent fire inspection report. That's another document that Jeremy just handed me as I walked in tonight, so I'm happy to report. We can cross that one off the list as well. Um, health inspection report, that one came in yesterday, so that one's 100%. Uh, number seven, proof of submission to the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources. So this is one we're working closely with our um, civil engineer on. We essentially have to submit an application. We have to submit proof that we submitted an application to the state that they're going to review um, some of the existing structures on site. We don't really anticipate any, any issues with what we're doing. Recognize that we are demoing um, Dairy Village as part of this project, um, but that is underway. I expect to have that uh, late this week or early next week. Um, doc number eight, documentation that you've reached out to your utility company, and we have done that. We have that in record. So I'd say that's even past the 50% that you're seeing here. Number nine, mechanical, electrical, structural plumbing reports. That was uh, a big chunk of that was done um, last year when we did the facility study. So it was really just distilling that into the two buildings that are affected by this project. So that's done. Um, number 10, life cycle cost analysis. So that's really looking at a 30 year life cycle cost for the, for the new building. Um, that's taking into account the construction cost, but also the long term maintenance cost of that building. So what does it cost to replace the mechanical systems over time? What does it cost to replace the roofing? Um, and again, we've completed that. Uh, number 11, design capacity documentation. We're all set with that. And number 12, educational capacity calculations, all set with that as well. Um, 13, outline of technical specifications. So that goes hand in hand with our design drawings. So um, those will be used to help determine what the systems are in the building, what the finishes are. It's really a basis of design um, as we start looking at um, figuring out what pieces and parts of the building are and specific materials. 
Um, and that, again, factors into uh, some of the budget pieces as well. Uh, 14, a general layout map showing uh, total square footage and year of construction. We've done this for Derry Village and South Range. Just a general map that shows those two buildings as well as the new building as it, with the total square footage in there. 15 is the preliminary site plan, which is what we saw tonight. So that's, that's complete as well. Uh, preliminary architectural drawings. So again, those are the floor plans we were looking at tonight. Um, there's still a little bit of refining to do on those, but those are mostly complete. Number 17, site addendum. Um, this again is another item we're working closely with our civil engineer on, um, and we're well underway with it. We expect to have this um, either by the end of this week or early next week. And number 18 is just a digital copy of, of the application and all of the attachments that go with it. So that will be submitted um, by July 1st for that deadline. So I know there was a lot of information in there, um, but I'm hoping we kind of covered those three pieces well and I'd like to open it up for if there's any questions on any of those. At this time, I'm going to let, I'll let the board ask questions first and then members of the public can ask questions. I just had a quick question on the uh, West Running Brook portion. That, look, we added that access road. Uh, does that stay away from the current uh, athletic fields here? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. We could Thank work you. around that. So you have a plan to demo Dairy Village. What are we doing with South Range, the school that is supposed supposedly the worst of the schools that need to be replaced? So the we need to have in here the plan to demo Dairy Village because it's part of the cost of this project. But what we do with South Range is separate from this plan in terms of the submission to the state, not in terms of what we have to decide. But there's still a cost to it with this, with this plan. Yes, there is a cost to whatever we do with South Range, whether we demo it or try to sell it or try to reuse it. Uh, Eric. Eric, I have a question about the contingencies on the, um, I'm just going to say the bill of materials, the line items. It sure. calls out like 4.3 million, but then on that site plan that has the bubbles on there, it calls out 9.3. Could you explain the difference between those two? Sure. So, um, so we've broken it out into um, contingency for construction. Um, so that's that five and, a half, five and a half million you're seeing there. That really is reserved for during construction of the building. Um, we like to have some money set aside for either unexpected conditions or items that are added on during design. Um, and the owner's construction contingency, that 4.3, um, we could consider that during design. Um, it's flexible money as we're looking at programming and as we're looking at more of the conceptual piece to the design. Um, but you're right, so once we combine that five and a half with that 4.3, that's where we're at the over 9 million for those. Okay, but that ke still keeps that price at just under 75 million. It's not 74, Correct. 70. Okay. Yep, right. that's, Thank you. that's everything included. Appreciate yep. it. So adding on to the contingency, that's about 13% of the total cost. Is that, I'm not in the industry, is that a normal type of number in that? Yes, yeah, so the. Thank you. The, con the construction contingency represents about 10%, and that is at this early stage, and as the design is completed, that percentage at the start of construction would be something less, probably 5% would be my recommendation. That's typical. But because we're so early and there's a lot of things we don't know, we go with a higher percentage. Um, and then the owner can choose to do the same thing on, on their end. Once you've bid your furniture and once you know what all your technology is going to cost, maybe at the start of the project, you know, your, your contingency gets reduced. So um, if, uh, if you could follow me um, with uh, and dispel any, <coughs> any uh, conclusions that I have that may be in error or um, inform me about uh, 
what I'm asking here. So the bottom line is 74970567 for the entire building, including the deep, right? Correct, including deep, yeah. Okay, so if we wanted to obtain a relatively accurate uh, number without the deep, I look up here um, under Section 5, and um, deep pre, uh, pre-K school area is 3.7 million. We would just deduct that off of the seventy uh, off of the seventy four point nine. Yeah, I, I believe at that point that would be safe to, to deduct that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, but I also note that <clears throat> there's a seven point five million dollar site development for the entire. Would there be a proportion of that that would be reduced also if deep was eliminated from plan? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it would be more than. $3.7 million. Um, we don't know how much, but it would be reasonable to assume there'd be a proportion there. There would be some amount less. Some yeah, amount, right. okay. I was, I was just trying to think, figure out what the total amount would be if we did not include the deep so that um, we could get a better handle on what we're talking about in terms of money here, especially since the state isn't going to cover that at all. So thank you very right. much. I had a question about equipment. Um, when you have this line for $2.3 million for equipment, furniture, and procurement, does that assume we're bringing all new furniture and equipment in that we're not reusing anything from any of our schools? Correct, yes. Yep, new furniture. And so that, I, if I can just add on to that. So that includes everything from your kitchen equipment in the cafeteria, your gymnasium equipment. It's, it's a lot more than just tables and chairs. Um, you know, equipment that goes into the school that actually gets, you know, installed into the school. So would there be a substantial difference or is this generally discussed that, you know, because I would assume we wouldn't buy, say, all new desks for a new school when we have desks in other schools or chairs or I, I don't know what. There's a lot of equipment in schools. Sure. I assume we don't, we don't want to just get rid of it. Abs absolutely. And I think, I think what this cost is telling us is it's almost like a worst case scenario if it were all new, um, and certainly there are opportunities in, in each of these line items where we could look at reducing that cost um, as needed, and that would be a great case if, you know, if there were existing furniture to reuse, um, that, that would bring down that, that 2.3 that you're referencing. I think that's, that's a, I don't know, good segue to my next question, I guess, is so, um, I know in the past we've talked about there could be some changes to this, even though we're applying for this from a state state stands, state's standpoint. Um, I guess, is there a general rule of thumb of like plus or minus where, you know, we look at this and equipment or um, I've looked at like, I mean, even, even as something as, as much as like fields or stage for the new school, like those types of things, I guess what type of, yeah, plus minus do we see that we could potentially reduce the cost, um, I guess that's probably, yeah, not plus or minus, more about minus. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if it, it would be tough. We'd, we'd really have to kind of go line by line. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm comfortable giving you a percentage off the top of my head, but certainly you bring up good points about the fields. You know, we could look at um, developing just a couple of fields or one of the fields if that were required. I mean, each field you're talking about almost a half a million each. Um, so I, I think there's opportunity to look at all of these things piecemeal and, and see where there are savings. Uh, so to go back to the beginning, so I guess, do we know what kind of design changes that would kind of still allow us that to say, I mean, uh, again, we're looking at 75, is that saying, all right, well, if we come up and we have some different ideas and we reduce it to 73. Is that something that the state is going to have an issue with? Would that be considered a substantial change? Um, I, I wouldn't expect that it would be, um, given, given how early we are in conceptual design, so. So that was kind of my question too, is what flexibility do we have after, say we vote on $75 million, what, what's the flexibility that we have with the state to continue on with the process if we do make change, changes? So I, 
My impression is is that we're we're simply not making substantial changes to the building. Um, to this point, we're we're really just looking at conceptual opinion of costs anyway. So, um, but I'm not. To be honest, I'm not sure what that threshold for ch for change would be from the state's perspective. That would be something I could look into. The uh, thank you for the including the uh, the very last chart that over a three year period we see the uh, increases in um, <coughs> the cost of materials and um, <coughs> from an inverse standpoint when we demo Derry Village, um, any of the, um, any of the, the materials that are taken from there that can be um, resold or uh, repurposed, uh, <coughs> scrapped if you will, um, and there's, um, there's a realization of, um, of return on that, does that go to the, uh, to the demo uh, contract or does that get returned to the district so if that were the case that money could be returned I believe um, I mean we have a lot of other things besides just copper wire we have all of the as um, the gentleman I'm sorry Mark Mark I'm sorry as Mark said okay. that um, you know a lot of the things that you customarily would include in a new school um, the core facilities are going to be new obviously but the, uh, the ones that are remaining in Derry Village may be uh, repurposed for something outside the district that we could um, sell off or cost, I, I would imagine the contractor would sell it off, they're smart enough to do that. But uh, if they're doing that and we own it, we should be realizing the return on that though. Yeah, you, you'd have the opportunity before the contractor came into the building to, to demo it or to even bid demoing it to remove anything you wanted from it and, and take that value directly to yourself. Once the demo contractor sort of takes possession of the building, anything they, you know, recycle or save typically is in, you know, the money goes into their pocket. Right. And their bid takes account for that, you know. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do any other members of the board have any questions before I open it up to members of the public? Yeah, the I mean, so, Noting the increases in building materials and prices and things like that. Um, I know when we started this conversation uh, about potentially building a new school, we'd seen a range of 55 to 65. That's obviously grown to 75 now. Um, is there, do you guys have, a, I wish I could say you guys had a crystal ball where you guys could say, hey, well, in two years' time, it's going to be X amount more dollars, or I would love for it to be less than that. Um, I know that there are some trends now where we have seen buildings or new construction start to slow down where completion of new buildings is um, is ramping up but new buildings and new permits are decreasing. Do we potentially see that as being a, a an opportunity for the district to where we could see some reduced costs um, just because of the demand going down? I think we've done our best to guess what the future holds. Um, based on recent history. Um, so, again, that's taken into account because we are assuming that this project, you know, goes out to bid very late 23 or early 24. So, again, we've, we've tried to take that into account best we can. Um, it's hard to imagine it's going to get much worse out there in the industry uh, with the market conditions. Um, but we can't bank on it getting, you know, back to 2019. So we've... we've sort of done something in between. Appreciate that. Yeah, and that, yeah. Uh, I'm sure I think this was probably covered more in the application or the interview process when we started this whole um, thing. But what I guess what type of results do you guys have as making sure that obviously timeline is important, but also coming in on budget or under budget? Um, can you guys discuss more about that maybe through estimations and what your success rate is or Eric, anything that you guys have seen? <clears throat> well, I can speak to mine. I mean, I, you know, again, been doing this a long time and uh, pretty good track record at, uh, you know, again, being able to predict uh, where prices are going to go. That was a little bit easier when historical averages were 3 to 6% a year in inflation, and more than that now. Um, but one thing, getting back to your earlier question, is 
these numbers are based on discussions we've had with Lavalley Brenzinger about materials and systems and different things. And as the district gets involved, making some decisions on let's, you know, is, does the building have brick or does it have something else or does it have a combination? So, you know, we've we've included one choice, and if that choice, you know, to bring down the cost, you choose a little bit uh, less expensive material, um, then then you save. Um, I think we've tried to be fairly conservative in, in, a, in a mid to high level school, you know, not building the Taj Mahal, but something, you know, that's gonna last 50 to 100 years, which is what you want. Um, and, and those costs have been factored in. So you certainly will have the time to make all the 100,000 decisions to be made on, on the parts and pieces of the school, which will affect the price. Um, so there is room to bring the number down. Um, but some of those decisions come with, you know, consequences in higher maintenance costs or shorter, uh, you know, uh, lifetime of equipment and things like that. So discussions to have in the future, for sure. Just for a basic information to remind the public, could you remind people the student capacity of the building, both in terms of our capacity based on the number of students we put in a class in the state capacity and then also the square footage of the building? Yep, so the capacity of the building right now is, is 730. Um, and square footage, um, not including deep, is 120,000. With deep is 130,000. Thank you. Yep. And just to follow up on your question too, Jonathan, from the design side, um, you know, as we're, as we're working on the building, we work as closely as we can with cost estimators and with contractors. Um, and as we go through design, we refine that design more and more. Um, we put out packages, uh, milestone packages like schematic design and design development. Um, and really, as we refine that design, we work very closely with an estimator or a contractor to figure out, okay, what are the changes as we work through the design? Is it starting to get a little bit high? Is there scope creep? How do we work with that? So it's really, from our perspective, it's really just about managing those costs over time and making sure that we're kind of getting these real-time updates um, and making sure that we're working closely with <laughs> people in the field that, that know the business, so. So just for the public, for reference, Barca is about 100,000 square feet. So this building will be about 20% bigger than Barca, but that does include moving deep into the building, which is something deep accounts for 75 students of those 730. Correct. So at this time, are there any other members of the board that have questions, or should I open it up to the public? Brenda? Oh, sorry, then David. Do you have an estimate of what um, the amount of change, the cost of change orders in a project like this would be? Because I know there's going to be change orders and that there's a cost to that. So do you have a, a percentage or a kind of an average of what that would be? Well, what there's, do you typically there's see? a couple of different kinds of change <laughs> orders. There's, there's change orders that are owner driven. When the owner comes to the table and says, we want this, and that's not currently in the plan. I can't predict that uh, here in Derry, but you know, typically that can be three to 5%. Um, things you think of along the way, changes you make. Um, on the contractor side, you know, the, their contingency, you know, the, again, they'll have some swing and misses. Uh, hopefully they have some home runs. So those tend to average out for the duration of the project, but they, you know, couple, two to 3% uh, on their end, things that uh, they didn't account for, or again, they have a low bid and that low bidder decides they don't no longer want to do the project and they have to go to the second low bid after the fact. And, you know, or if you have a material escalation during the project, which is happening a lot right now. Um, so, so those are types of things that the contractor's contingency would be used for. But again, if the owner comes to the table and, and wants something else, then, then that comes out of the owner's contingency. For new schools nowadays, what's the typical square footage per child? This one looks like it's about 180 square feet. The DOE standard, um, don't quote me on this, I believe it's just over 150, um, and we're, we're a little bit over that. Um, so we, th we think, you know, based on, based on your program and some of the spaces we're looking at, it en does end up being, I think it's like 15 feet, 15 square feet a, uh, a pupil more. 
um, but again, that's those are pretty good averages. Do you, any other members of the board have questions? If not, I will ask Eric and Mark if you can just sit in the front row, and I'll invite members of the public to ask questions and. Eric and Mark can come up and answer them depending on what your question is. I would just remind people that questions during is the same as is the same as discussions and individuals, so we ask that we give your name and address for the record. Good evening everybody. Lynn Perkins uh, for Woodland Street Dairy. Um, I, I haven't been too tuned in completely uh, as we've been going along, um, but have we had discussions yet about the transition of the SAU, the admin team, and uh, DEEP, and what's going to fill those voids as we shift things around in the district and move things out of uh, one building and consolidate it in another? So that's uh, important information as well as the price. So I like the progression of the cost seeing that uh, proposed so we know have a barometer direction we're going, but um, those other elements are, I think are key and uh, as soon as those can be produced, that would be handy for everybody. So uh, that's it, thank you. Do other members of the public have questions about the facilities? Richard, do you have a question? I'm waiting for somebody else to ask yeah. questions because it might, you know, drive something that I had overlooked. John, you have one. But, are you gonna chat? Yeah, sure. No, no, no. <laughs> You're good? I'm good, yeah. All right. Now. Hi. Uh, good evening. Richard Tripp, 44 Wyndham Road. Uh, thank you for having this tonight. I think it's important that uh, uh, the public be given an opportunity to uh, ask questions about you know, your plan and uh, what you're going to, uh, what you're going to be doing. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that uh, uh, nobody seems to care you know, the uh, you would think that on a, a night where you're giving a uh, uh, almost final estimate of what the new school is going to look like and uh, what it's going to cost nobody shows up but uh, hey you know, as long as you can get them to just approve the bond, who cares? Uh, I have a number of questions. Uh, do you have, uh, do you have to go before the, the planning and the conservation board to get approval before you build a school? Uh, I know you don't have to answer the questions tonight because they'll be on the frequently asked questions page later on, right? Right, John? No, they won't. Uh, I would think that uh, if you're going to go forward with uh, the project and something that, uh, nothing for South Range is included in this, that you would at least have a, a cost estimate for what uh, would be done with South Range. You know, uh, the, uh, we're, if you don't have a cost estimate, I guess you can, you know, wing it in the future. You know, you've done that in the past. But uh, uh, the, the people, the, the public should have some idea, you know, uh, if you're going to tear it down what the estimated costs are going to be. If you're going to try and sell it, what uh, you believe the revenue from the sale would be. You know, it would show that, uh, you know, you, you've done due diligence. 
Uh, when I when I saw the the uh, plans tonight, I thought it was interesting that you're building two baseball fields. You know, uh, like uh, uh, Eric said, they're they're under a half million, but you know, still, you know, that's a uh, that's a considerable amount. Uh, I I was uh, wondering why uh, you only build one soccer field. You know, it it seems that uh, baseball is something that's you know a past you know recreation. You know, and uh, the uh, for a half a million, you could get another soccer field or something that uh, I think would get a lot more use because uh, uh, I think soccer is, is more of a uh, uh, current and up and coming uh, sport that uh, uh, would be better utilized in the town. Uh, this kind of goes with uh, the planning and comp conservation approval aspect. Are there any wetlands in this area, especially in the area where you're planning to build a school? No, because uh, I see you do have wetland mitigation money, but uh, uh, you'll, you'll find out that the Conservation Commission is a hard bargainer. They, uh, they are not gonna let you get away with uh, filling you know, a, a wetland. Eric, can you answer that question? Well, oh, or do you? Do we, I would prefer this, these questions to be answered on the frequently asked questions page. We can do that, but I'm also gonna have Eric answer it in public because I want people to hear the answer. Oh. So w you're right, we do need to do those wetland studies. Um, we have not done site surveys yet, um, given, given the early phase of this project, and there's, there's opportunity to, to look at the site um, and, and if, if wetlands were an issue to, to reconfigure where the building is as well. But you're right, that, that would be part of the early phases of, of design once we, once we get there to do that survey. Yeah, because like I said, I don't, I don't know if this project falls under the purview of the uh, uh, Planning and Conservation Board, but uh, I sit on the zoning board and one of the things that is, comes up on a lot of the cases is wetland issues. And uh, between you know, the zoning board and the conservation commission, you know, we're, we're not very good about giving people leeway in destroying wetlands because wetlands are, are uh, important. You know, we need the water in an aquifer, you know, and I know that you believe a school is important. Well, there's other people in the town that believe that water is important. So, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're going to look into that. Now, I, I understood you have, let's see. You don't have any cost estimate for uh, what uh, the equipment in the South, no, Dairy Village would be worth. Uh, has anyone looked into whether there's even a market for used school equipment? You know, I, I wouldn't be putting many eggs in a basket that says we're going to get, you know, $200,000 from the, the, the school furniture if there's no market for it, you know? So uh, I think there's some things that need to be looked at. You know, right now you're focused on getting a new school built. Well, there's, when you do a project of this magnitude, I think you'll find that there's often unintended consequences. And uh, you need to be thinking about these things. I, I, I 
truly wish the public was more involved in this because, you know, they bring a lot of things to the table that, you know, I don't think you guys have even considered, you know, but uh, uh, like I said, I was hoping that someone else would speak. My hopes are, you know, on Matt again, because I would, I would like to see what other people think about this. And, uh, you know, it appears that no one thinks anything about it. So uh, good luck on getting the bond approved. Thank you for your questions. Well, now you're going to go up. It's because you kind Dick, of talk my memory about some things. Dick, I, just a couple thoughts on uh, Mr. Tripp, um, on, on his, uh, his uh, questions. I also thought about the uh, cost of, dem of demolition to uh, South Range. And I looked at the cost for Derry Village, and they're about the same. Derry Village is a little bit bigger. So my estimate, and the gentleman from uh, the architectural firm can correct me, but my estimate to myself being, you know, using reason, is that it would probably be somewhere in the vicinity of just under a million dollars. Um, but, you know, I, I am using the same powers of deductions that any layman would use. Um, the other thing that, um, and that's a good point about the baseball field, but what people, I think, don't realize when this school was built, middle schools have a baseball team, and um, this school never had a baseball diamond, um, and there's been several attempts to, um, to build one. Um, the layout of the, the land doesn't lend itself to it very well. Um, and um, it was very difficult to try to fund one. So the baseball team here is by its very nature almost constantly a traveling one. So my thought is that if they could put the baseball field down there, it would accommodate the middle school um, without having to go through whatever um, other issues you have to up here. But there again, that's just a, a deductive reasoning on my part, but whatever. I just thought I'd share that with you. Yeah, I think adding on to that, um, I think in the discussions we've had in the sub, subcommittee meetings is that there are two baseball fields now. There's one large soccer field now. We want we don't want to diminish what is there. We want to keep current um, or improve what there what's there. Um, also, a few other things. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we are discussing the school building application. Um, that that's that's what we are doing today, and that's what we've been doing for the past four to six weeks um, is filling out that application because we do have a deadline. I don't think we have any intentions to um, have any, to go around the zoning uh, or to not uh, conserve any land that is currently there. Um, and so uh, I don't think we're focused on building a new, a, a new school right now. I think we're focused on completing the application so that we have the best chance to get up to 45% of funding. Um, and there is a long road to hoe um, between now and uh, even when we kick off the uh, construction, if it were to get approved. So um, these are all considerations that uh, we've had conversations with uh, or conversations about or some discussions about, um, and we appreciate those things. And I think uh, over the course of the next, again, hopefully three to six months, we'll be able to continue to answer those questions as well. Um, yeah. Butch? Good evening, Butch Tepe Bowers Road. Uh, so first of all, um, you guys kind of answered a lot of my questions <laughs> between Richard and, um, and Jonathan and, and, and Paul. Uh, so my, one of my concerns was, uh, was the, the fields. Um, you know, I remember this past um, um, winter and, and, and spring uh, with the uh, recent town elections, one of the discussions in there was, was regarding, you know, a lot of lack of things for kids to do. So um, I understand and I, I totally am, am for, you know, trying to cut where, wherever we can to uh, make this, uh, this, this dollar amount as, as small as it is. But um, there are certain things that I just, I, me personally, I, I would not even go close to cutting. And, and one of those things is fields. Um, so, um, and I think that's a great idea, Paul, regarding the, um, the use of the fields for, for, the, for the, uh, the middle school. Um, 
have you guys reached out, speaking of the fields, to the, the town in regards to usage of fields? Um, has there any been, been any discussion with them or input from them on, uh, you know, what type of usage our current fields get um, and, you know, how, how much of a, because um, I think that would kind of answer some of the questions as well, of whether or not we, it's something we should even look at for cutting. Has, it, has that anyone reached out to the Parks and Recreations Department or anything like that? Jane and Jeremy and I have been in ongoing discussions with the town about um, their proposal. They had an entire proposal laid out for a um, rather large baseball field and a walking path around that. Um, that came to a halt from our understanding. So I don't know whether that's still on the table or not, but we had some ongoing discussions. We were out in the uh, West Rennenberg area where the current fields are. So we had ongoing discussions about that. We haven't had a discussion for quite some time because I believe that came to a halt. So, but there are extensive plans, or there were extensive plans, mm -hmm. I assume they're still there, um, for what they once had for um, the baseball field, the walking paths, and so forth. Okay. Uh, the, Brits, can I just answer one of your yeah, other questions? Absolutely. On the topic of fields as well, just so people know, kind of understand the scope of the issue, the majority of sports actually in the spring at West Running Brook have to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. There's not a field to play lacrosse. There's nothing, no place to do track. So there, we're, but we're busing, we're paying for a bus to bus kids to another school so that there's an area to do track. So we really do, we do need those fields because we don't have those fields right now, so the middle school kids at West Running Brook have less access to fields. It, 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 I, I agree. So I just wanted yeah. to kind of let you know some of the other. And the only reason I bring it up is because it was brought up for you know a, a point of discussion on, on cutting costs. So um, with South Range, when the decision's made of what we're going to do with South Range, um, that money, wh where's that money going to go? Is, is it going to go to offset some of this, this project here, or is it going to go into um, another fund for something else? Um, have we had any discussions about that, or do we have any ideas of what's going to happen with that? So we haven't had any discussions on that, but if it was going to go into any fund, say, uh, construction or some kind of account for a specific reason, that would need to be voted on by taxpayers. If we create any fund for a specific purpose, it has to be on a warrant article and voted by taxpayers. Okay, because I mean, just for me personally, I mean, I, I, if we're, you know, forcing these kids to go out of this school and into a brand new school, I mean, if we're going to, you know, demolish that and sell that property off, I think it should go towards the project that, you know, it was all included into, so, and a reason for it, so. Um, and then just, uh, uh, actually, you know what, my, my last point, I'll, I'll save till later. Thank you. Do any members of the public have any questions at this time? I have one more. Could, would you be willing, you can ask one more, but could you make it quick because we do have a tight, a tight packed agenda. Uh, uh, Richard Tripp, 44 Wyndham Road. Uh, Eric kind of touched on this during his presentation. Uh, the, uh, but uh, he didn't, he touched on it, but he didn't really give a good explanation. Uh, since we don't know what the future costs are gonna be, and we don't know uh, if the school can modify the design a lot, uh, I guess the question that I had was, if the future cost exceeds what it takes to build the new school. What happens to this school building aid that you would get if you can't use it? But can you repurpose it? So I don't know the answer to that question, but that is the reason why there's $10 million in contingencies in this project because of the unknown escalation in costs. And that's was estimated as a safe amount to cover what could be escalating costs. But to your question of if it costs more than what, say, if a bond does pass, and we, I don't know what happens in that case. I don't know, Jane, do you know how that, what happens in that case? Are you asking if the project comes in more, whether the state will continue to Will they adjust their 45? Is that what you're asking? Well, I'm just I'm, I'm, uh, asking 
if the school board ultimately decides that there's uh, no way that the, the new school can be built with the existing funds, uh, can they repurpose those funds to do something else or does the, the money go back to the state? It, you mean if we choose not to build the building but yes. we get approved through school building aid? Yes. No, you'd have to go through the whole application process again. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Is that just kind of what those assurances are that we just kind of signed for ESSER funds and things like that? We would have to sign something similar for the state to say we're receiving this money, we're using it for this purpose, right? Right. You'd only be able to do the project that you've been approved for that Eric is um, Eric and Mark are estimating. Does anyone, any members of the board have any other questions on the facilities report at this time? I don't have a question. I just want to thank Mark and Eric for coming out here tonight. Um, again, you guys are always well prepared. Um, appreciate you guys putting in the work and um, I know I, I would say that just in my experience, uh, you guys have been great. Um, you guys are well prepared, you're well educated. Um, I think the answers you guys give us are candid. Um, I think, again, I have nothing but uh, good things to say about you guys. Um, so I appreciate you guys continuing to do that and put in the good work. Thank you. Thank you. That was actually what I was gonna say. So thank you very much. Thank you. And just a reminder to the public that we do, if you have questions, you can email us, you can come to meetings. You can come to these presentations and ask questions. We welcome questions, and we do get back to people that email us with questions. So thank you very much, both Eric and Mark, for your time tonight. Thank you. Our next. Um, hold up, Mary. Erica, um, we need to make a motion on that so that it can go to the application. Do you want to make that motion? <laughs> yes. So I'm listening. First of all, you know that I have not been in favor of this project. But now I'm listening to here's the project, here's the plan, this is what we want to do. How can we make it smaller? How can we cut the cost? What can we cut out of it? That concerns me a lot. Um, I also think it's really short sighted of us, and I'll include myself in that because I'm part of you, um, that we have not looked at finding what we can do with renovations and adding that to the application with the state because there are opportunities for renovations, uh, funding for renovations, and I think it's very short-sighted of us to be do not to be doing that. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the questions need to be asked about if there's potential changes that we could make that Instead of, again, because we started off with a, a range of 55 to 65 million. Um, I, I think we all wish and hope that it would be in that same, that same range. It's not. Um, and then there's a lot of different factors that go into that, and there's no one's fault that that's the way it is. But I think it's also, we have a responsibility of making sure that what we put on the warrant is something that is feasible for the taxpayers should we potentially get um, get that so if there are some changes that result in a, some cost savings I think that's important those are important answers to have um, I don't think anyone is advocating to say hey we should remove programs or remove stages or remove fields it's those are things that again I think they're tough questions that need to be asked um, as far as the as far as the renovations I, I, I don't know I feel like we had this discussion multiple times um, I don't know if anyone else feels any differently about that but I think we feel I'm not going to say we, I'll say I, I feel, and I think the board, we voted as a board that the best path forward to potentially get any type of state funding um, based off of the recommendations from Lovely Brenzinger um, and kind of our thoughts and what, what the district needs as far as um, having four elementary schools that we can sustainably, fiscally sustain um, this new, the new school building would give us that best option. So those are my thoughts. I don't know if anyone else has anything else that they would like to add. Well, it just doesn't make sense to me that because we were told in the beginning that there could be multiple applications for funding. So why not take advantage of multiple applications? Obviously, that's a car has gone because today is J June 21st. It's not going to happen. I think it's short-sighted. 
but there's also planning going on all summer long for Plan B, just in case, that is not going to have any opportunity for state funding. It's going to have opportunity for taxpayer funding, and I just don't, th I think it's short-sighted, that's all. So, Marianne, what, what, what legally do we need to do in terms of a motion? I guess I'm a little uncertain about what motion we need to make, or Jane. Uh, so you'll want to make a motion um, to approve the, uh, to move forward the school building aid project in the amount of, that was presented for the um, 75 million or estimated 75 million. So you would want to make a motion that the board makes a motion to approve um, the build, school building aid application in the amount of 75, estimated 75 million. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, one thing, and it's a cautionary note to everyone. Um, we've seen buildings uh, that we have right now that, uh, you know, the questions are always asked, how do they get in the shape that we're in? And uh, the invariable answer is that, well, that's be what we can afford at the time. And I think we have to be very, very, very careful right now. Um, and I understand that construction costs are going up. They're going up. I, I, I'm in the middle of a construction project in my house, and I can't get materials. Um, and when I get them, they're going to be more expensive than I ever thought they'd be. But um, the, the, what I fear a great deal is that when the price goes up and the price goes up, in order to stay within what we consider to be affordable, we're going to start cutting things and cutting things. And I don't mean cutting out of an athletic field because the quality of the uh, building remains the same, but I mean using materials that weren't what we probably initially started with and things. And then 20 years down the road going, well, why is the school that replaced Derry Village in the shape it's in? And we get the old, you know, the shrug, it's like, well, because that's what we could afford at the time. And um, we have to be really, really careful of that, I think. Um, and uh, I, I think that, um, you know, if it comes down to a situation where we can't afford um, that, then, you know, the, we have to look at that carefully. But I think before we do that, we have to look at, you know, um, the, the, we have to consider the, the cutting costs and where we're cutting them, not uh, cutting the quality of uh, the building so that, like I said, um, we'll, be, um, we'll be looking at the same situation with that school that we have with the other schools now in 20 years. So that was just my thought on that. Paul, I would agree with you. I, I think in the discussion tonight, I don't think anybody was advocating to cut the quality of the building envelope. I think we we're just trying to figure out, you know, based on what we're submitting for an application, what can we do if need be? I think that's important to know, like how much flexibility we have after we submit this application of, you know, understanding that process. I don't think anybody is talking about changing the quality of, I mean, I think we all know where, where that's taken us um, 20 years ago, where we are today. We're where we are today because we cut corn. Well, I won't go down. We made decisions. Decisions were made that, you know, that weren't the best, and then we were, that's where we are today. So hopefully we learn from those decisions and we won't go that route. And I'm confident that everyone sitting here today understands that and, and, um, and that won't be a factor when we make our final decisions. Eric, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes. So I'm lucky to have Jay on text. Um, so he noted that the state application can be amended from now until January. So there is opportunity to make that change in this time frame. Um, things can be reduced if needed, um, and there are items that can be backed out if needed. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> Shout out to Jay. Eric, I have another question. So on the state website, there's, a, there's several applications for dairy that include renovations. What happens to those? So all of those applications were placeholders because in order to be eligible for anything in January, we put in every single possible application we could do. And the only thing that counts is what you actually apply for July 1st. But if you didn't have it as a placeholder, you can't apply for it.
Jessica, do you want to, did you understand Jane's motion? Unless, does anyone else have any other questions before then? Okay. I make a motion to approve the school building aid application in the amount of 75 million. I am gonna call for a roll call vote in this case. I'll start with David. Yes. Derek. Yes. Paul. Yes. Jessica. Yes. John. Yes. Brenda. Yes, because I don't want to turn down free money if we get it, but I'm still not in favor of it. And the chair votes yes. Eric, thank you very much. Is that what you needed for that line item in the application? Yep. Thank you very much for your time tonight. And Mark, thank you, Mark. So for the benefit of the public, all of the, the presentation was online, is online on the website. If people want to look at it, there is a place to ask questions. You also saw we were answering a lot of questions tonight, and we will continue to have updates on this topic where you can come and ask questions. And I fully encourage you to come. I would love to see a room full of people out there asking questions and bringing in comments. Our next agenda item tonight is the Fiscal Advisory Committee. Hey, good evening, everyone, again. Um, fiscal advisory application deadline was June 9th, and there were two applications received for the one-year term. Only one spot was available for the one-year term. Um, Stephen Schaefer was contacted as he had submitted his application first, and Stephen would like to serve for a two-year term. The following are the applicants to be appointed to the Fiscal Advisory Committee. One-year term, Harris Talek. Two-year term, Stephen Schaefer. And a two-year term, Carl Denyu. Three-year term, Christopher Broom. And three-year term, David McPherson. So we'd like to thank all of those Fiscal Advisory applicants. And we do need a board vote for the nominations. Motion to approve the applicants. Second. A first by Jessica and a second by John. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I would just like to note there were five openings and we got five spots so some people had asked us whether we would have a, some process for vetting people or choosing and in this case we had the number of people as we'd have spots so that was not an issue in this case. It was just the years of those terms. Erica, before we move on, so I know we talked about alternates. Are those positions still open if somebody would like to become an alternate between now and budgeting season? We do have a policy that states that we can have alternates. Um, if you so choose, the deadline was June 9th. The board would have to vote to extend that deadline, I believe, through a, you know, through a vote. That's all that it would take. So okay. if there are some people out there that miss the deadline but are thinking back on it and think they'd really like to get involved, please contact us and we can consider that. Thank you, John. So we do need a motion to accept the, did I hear that right, Marion? Oh, we did that, okay, great. Sorry about that, not trying to extend a long meeting any longer, I promise. Um, so we are now on to policy. All right, policies should be pretty quick tonight. Policies presented this evening for a second reading are as follows. Policy BCC, appointed board officials, school district treasurer, clerk, and recording secretary. Policy GBCD, background investigation and criminal records check. And policy IJOC, school volunteers. So of the people remaining at the table, does anyone have any questions on the second reading of this policy? So Marion, why don't you go over the final one in hopes that the two people come back okay. before we vote. And policy GCAA, highly qualified teachers, is presented this evening for a second time to approve the withdrawal of this policy. I have a question. Does this mean we don't have highly qualified teachers anymore? That, no, we, that was a little tongue in cheek. I apologize. The highly qualified <laughs> teachers was withdrawn. That policy has been withdrawn. We do have highly qualified teachers. It's not in that sense of the wording of highly qualified teachers. 
that wording was taken away, as I think I explained last time, and I can go over it if you want. We do have high, we have certified teachers in, in most cases, yes, we do, and there are always exceptions that there are some are on an old path. However, um, there's new exceptions to the rule. If you want me to go through all those as well, probably not at this time. However, that, <laughs> however, um, that highly qualified teacher terminology was taken away. Board. Therefore, if there's a withdrawal of that policy, I need to bring that to the board per board policy. So for the benefit of the public, that, that particular wording was tied to a federal law that is no longer a federal law, which is why we do not need that policy anymore because that, that law and the language that led it no longer exists. Motion to approve policy changes to BCC, GBCD, IJOC, and withdraw GCAA. Second. A first. a first by Derek and a second by Jonathan. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, but just note six. So our next item is the superintendent's update. Okay, good thing I'm organized here. <laughs> Not allowed in school. <laughs> so for, the, for those in the audience, just remember, Marianne has been giving superintendents updates for many years, and this is her last one. So this is a big moment for her. <laughs> That's what I think Austin was hoping for, for a brief one. Um, I'll try my best to get through this quickly. However, as you know, I'm pretty detailed. So. During the past several weeks, numerous celebrations have been held in the Derry School District. As most of you know, these have included the wonderful middle school promotion ceremonies for Gilbert H. Hood Middle School and West Runnybrook Middle School, which were held on Thursday, June 16th. The student speakers, chorus, and band, in addition to the celebratory mood at promotion, created a great atmosphere on Thursday for our eighth grade students and families. The PTSA celebrations at each school involved a great deal of work on the part of our families and staff. And for that, we are most grateful. Our eighth graders are wish the best of luck as they move on to high school, where they are encouraged to become actively involved in their school community. Thank you to our eighth grade students for making yourselves, your families, and all of us proud throughout your years in the Dairy Cooperative School District. End of your events and celebrations in our elementary and middle schools for our sixth and seventh graders, including Move Up Day, were very successful for students. Thank you to all who helped celebrate our elementary students, particularly fifth graders, moving on to middle school. Our middle schools look forward to your arrival. You can see the bulletin board out here, welcoming them as, as we enter. As of June 20th, 262 kindergarten students, so I switch from eighth grade all the way to kindergarten, have registered through the online process, an increase of six students since I last reported on June 6th. The district's website will direct families to the online registration form to register. If you don't have access to a computer, please contact your neighborhood elementary school to begin the registration process. Please register as soon as possible and your child's home school will then connect to you um, and contact you regarding the 22-23 school year. Projected enrollment continues to be reviewed in grades K through eight for the 22-23 school year. At this time, the classes and grades approaching or exceeding the district's recommended class sizes include, and there are additions since last time. Okay, so they include grade five at Derry Village, 25, 25, 26. Grade five at East Derry, 23, 25, 25. Grade five at Barca, 24, 24, 25. Grade four at South Range, 24, 25. Grade two at South Range, 19, 19, 18, 18. Grade three at Grinnell, 21, 21, 20. And grade one at East Derry, 19, 19, 18. And kindergarten at Grinnell, 18, 18, 17. Therefore, at kindergarten at Grinnell, there's one spot remaining. So as you can see, we're on the precipice of reaching or exceeding um, our class size policy in many grade levels. Um, you know, I, I always say that's very phlegmatic during the summer because we get registrations. We also get student withdrawals when families move and transition to other school districts. But I do want to make the board aware of those current um, class sizes. Those were looked at today and updated. I updated them last night. And then I looked at them again today with my administrator assistant, Kathleen Holtzman. 
Um, so again, you don't have a board meeting until mid-July, so I want to make sure that you're aware of that. Austin will continue to update you on those class sizes, okay? Um, the following are current vacancies within the Dairy Cooperative School District for the 22-23 school year. I do hope in July, when Austin reports out that we have many less than we do now. Um, I encourage people to apply um, through our online system on our website. I encourage you to call the um, SAU at 603-432-1210 if you have any questions or if you can't access the portal at all, and we'll help you maneuver through that process. District-wide vacancies, uh, custodians, we have multiple vacancies. We have child nutrition cook servers, speech and language pathologists. We have multiple vacancies for speech and language pathologists. Teacher of the deaf, we have part-time two days a week. New England Center for Children Instructional Tutors, our NECC program, we have multiple vacancies in that area. Licensed clinical therapists, we have one ESSER-funded position. That's predicated on the fact that one will be filled next week. Um, we have a school district treasurer and a school district deputy treasurer. In our DEEP program, we have special education assistant positions. At Dairy Village, we have special education assistants. And a special education teacher, we have two of those vacancies right now. And we have a computer assistant at Dairy Village. At Gilbert H. Hood, we have an English language arts teacher, a long-term substitute special education teacher, and special education assistants. You notice a commonality here among all schools. At South Range, we have a special education facilitator and special education assistants. At Grinnell, special, ed special education teacher, reading assistant, library assistant, computer assistant, and special education assistants. At East Area Memorial Elementary School, special education teacher, reading specialist slash special education teacher, which is a one-year position only for 22-23 and special education assistants. West Running Brook, library assistant, special education facilitator. We have two assistant principal vacancies at West Running Brook. Special education assistants and a special education teacher in the Project Me program. Ernest P. Barca, special education teacher, special education assistants, and reading assistants. Um, we do have a number of positions as you hear tonight. Um, if you know of anyone who would like to work in Derry, of course, I'm a little partial. I think it's the best place to work and be for students, um, and you'll hear that at the end of my report. Um, but we do encourage anyone who is interested in applying to apply, and um, I have permission to hire from now until the end of June, and Austin has permission to hire as of July 1st. So we encourage you to apply and become part of our educator community and learning community as one. Special thanks to Mr. David Minkle for all he's done for the Derry School District in the past 15 years as our television media coordinator. I know that David loves these accolades. This is his final school board meeting, and I believe David is more than deserving of special recognition this evening since he is so humble and kind and truly puts students first. Thank you, David, for your legacy that you're leaving in the Derry Cooperative School District. All the time you've given and your commitment are truly amazing, David, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You do a great job. That is not David's favorite moment. <laughs> Along with this, I wish to acknowledge our school board members, both present and past, for your incredible service to our community. I have had the privilege and honor of observing and working collaboratively with several board members throughout the years, and my appreciation is heartfelt for each of our past and current board members. Your roles are often challenging, and students remain at the center of your decisions. Erica, Jonathan, Derek, David, Paul, Jessica, and Brenda, Thank you for your time, dedication, commitment, and support of the Dairy Cooperative School District and for all that you do that goes unnoticed. I am most grateful for each of you. Thank you very, very much. If I went back in time and thanked each and every board member, um, it would take a very long time tonight. And I know some people on my right would be very displeased with me. 
<laughs> no names, no names, Austin. Um, finally, extend my most sincere thanks to our students, staff, families, and administrative team and the Derry Cooperative School District. In my opinion, Derry has the greatest student, staff, families, and administrators around, like anywhere. The connections made in Derry often last a lifetime, and we continue to work as a team to improve and strengthen our systems while celebrating ongoing accomplishments. In the words of A.A. Milne, sometimes the smallest things take up the most room in your heart. My heart is filled with gratitude for the kindness and happiness children have shared with others and with me. My hope for Derry's future is that the genuine kindness that emanates from our students serves as the model for learning, growth, and connections to prosper in the years ahead. Out. <laughs> we were kidding about that today. Not finished until June 30th, but out on the report. So that is going to be quite an act to follow, and we can't, we are very excited for you, very sad you'll be going, but I'm very excited for all the time you'll get with your family, because I know how much that means to you. It does, thanks, and, and with uh, Beth moving, and. Mom now, and I have to tell quick one, one quick story. You never give up on anyone, because about five weeks ago, they gave up on my mom. She couldn't speak in, in sentences because she had some pneumonia fatigue, and I w my husband and I were the ones who didn't give up, and five weeks later, she's speaking in sentences. So my story for everybody is you never give up. You always believe. And I told her that. I said, you know what? We always believe, and now you're speaking in sentences, and, and that's monumental. And that's why you don't ever, ever give up on anyone. So it's a little anecdote, but it goes a long way. So our Done. next, thank you. So our, our next agenda item is the revised 2022-2023 calendar. A little boring after that, <laughs> I must, I must admit. Um, uh, of course, the school gal calendar was approved um, way back when. Uh, we have one slight change. Uh, Jane Samad has worked uh, pretty hard to um, bring to the entire staff Stop the Bleed training. And uh, what, we've, what we're looking to do is take the September 30th early release day and uh, move that early release day to the last day of school, which right now, um, because uh, we're making uh, the 30th a teacher workshop day, is moved to uh, Wednesday, June 14th, otherwise known as Flag Day. Um, so <clears throat> we want to make September 30th a full teacher workshop day. That would give students a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three-day weekend, followed by a... Uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, the following um, three-day weekend. Um, we are going to, I want to thank uh, the AFSCME and DEA uh, unions. Um, the um, assistants, instead of coming in on Thursday, the 25th, they will come in on Friday. Um, that way they can be there for the whole day on uh, the 30th, and we're going to allow them to do other trainings along with the, the um, Stop the Bleeds, about two and a half hours, I think you said. Um, so everybody's going to get the Stop the Bleed training as well as uh, the rest of the day they'll be doing other trainings. And um, the DEA, I uh, want to thank uh, them. Uh, they will not have the last day after the students they will end the same day as the students. They'll say a full day, because that's what they do for early release days, and the students will have a, an early release on June 14th. So teacher workshop day on September 30th, and we will get, um, along with this, we will get something out to the uh, correspondence, out to the parents as well, just to let them uh, hear from us about this change. Are there any questions of Austin or a motion? Yeah. Motion to approve the revised 2022-2023 school calendar. First by Derek, second by Brenda. All in favor? 
Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. And just for people to note, in June, if we do extend into the following week, you'll see that we are off on June 19th because Juneteenth is now a holiday, which has not been the case in the past. That is so correct. Thank you. Our next agenda item is the school board meeting schedule. Austin? So we uh, we developed, um, um, I did everything in my power to get one school board meeting <laughs> in July and one in uh, uh, August, which I we actually have done. But um, the suggestion was, and I understand the need for this, um, to have facilities workshops in the month of July, August, and also in September. So one school member had a... Um, was not able to make one of the meetings, and I forget now if it was a school board and wanted to make a facilities, or if it was a facilities and wanted to make a school board. So um, what you see here is initially is July 12th and July 19th uh, facilities, and then a school board meeting, August 9th and August 23rd facilities workshop, followed by a school board meeting. And then in September, um, a school board and or facilities workshop, which we would determine um, in August, um, which that would be, if it would be a school board meeting and or a facilities workshop or just a facilities workshop. And then um, I added in here the um, district overview if we were going to go do that with the school board and the fiscal advisory committee. And then September 27th would be a school board meeting. Basically, the other option is just switched. School board meetings would be first, July 12th, August 9th, and September 13th. And then the facilities workshop would be July 19th, August 23rd, and September 27th, whether or not it was a school board meeting along with it or just a facilities workshop. Um, so if these dates work, uh, the idea is to determine uh, your preference for um, whether or not we do the facilities workshop earlier in the month and the school board towards the end of the month or vice versa. Jane, I had a question, actually. When when do we normally get into the weekly uh, budget committee meetings? Because Austin had included budget committee meetings in here, but there was a gap between October 17th and November 14th, and I don't... Obviously, that, that, ske that schedule is separate than the school board meeting, but since it was on here, I thought I'd ask the question, because I thought we started meeting weekly sooner than that, but I could be wrong. We start. We normally start at the beginning of the November. The problem is November starts on a Tuesday. The The Monday is the 31st, which is Halloween. Now, I do like giving out candy at my front door to the children that come, but, you know, if you... I, I assumed we did not want to have a meeting scheduled for Halloween. But normally we would have one um, right at the beginning of the uh, of November. So can I ask can I ask a question? So we're looking at possibly only having one school board meeting in September. Is that De the way I'm reading this? Depending on um, what is decided in August, if uh, it could be two school board meetings. the uh, The thought process was um, uh, having three facilities workshops. And whether or not there would be a school board meeting and a facilities workshop, which I think Derek actually mentioned at one point that maybe we could do both. Um, or it would just be depending on how the school, if, if you did the um, schedule with August 23rd as a school board meeting, and then uh, September 27th would be another school board meeting and uh, September 13th could be either just a facilities workshop or a school board and a facilities workshop. I, I mean, I just see, I guess my concern is the September 13th date where we're having the state primary election and a school board meeting or a facilities workshop. That's, I would say, probably not ideal. Um, that's just my two cents, though. But other than that, I mean, I mean, the dates are the dates. I feel like we, it's the beginning of the school year. We should have at least two that month. Um, 
uh, and if we need a third facilities workshop, we could push that into a different date and it doesn't have to be a Tuesday. I think we were trying to do the Tuesdays during the summer since we only had one school board meeting there. I also have a question of why do we not have a school board meeting on November 8th? No, that is a, um, oh, that's the um, state general election. Um, and my understanding was that would be a school board meeting. It just seems like it's a long time between school board meetings because of the Thanksgiving break to go from October 25th all the way to November 29th. Um, no, I'm saying that November 8th would be a school board meeting. Yeah, the school board meetings are just the dates. The only time I put, him in, I put SB in there was if there might be something else. So yes, there would be a November 8th school board meeting. And um, because of the Thanksgiving break, the second one would be pushed off to the 29th, which is the 5th. So I would, and I we had raised, I'd raised this when we spoke. I would agree that I believe we most likely we need two in September, whether that's a combined meeting or we do facilities at another time. But it may be best at this time to assume we'll do facilities at another time because at the beginning of the year there could be a lot of either beginning of the year activities or hiring and other other things that need to be addressed at the beginning of the year. And one of the things that Jane brought up, which is why September 19th is, and that's a Monday because it's. There was thoughts as to whether or not we were still going to be doing a district overview. There was talk last year or something about whether or not we would do a district overview, overview or not. So I believe that's still valuable because we do have new members joining the facilities committee who do, who do need to understand what the lay, the lay of the land is before they start reviewing our budgets. I'm not tuned into one particular date, but I think understanding the overall landscape before you start looking at the budget does have real value. And a number of the names that came forward today were new names, so. Including an awesome being promoted and Joe being added as well, so I'd say it's definitely needed. Yeah. So I think the 19th will be needed. Okay. So Austin, that was the one that had the request. Um, I won't be there July 12th, but I didn't want to miss the facilities workshop, so I just asked if we could flip the facilities workshop to the 19th instead of the 12th in July. That's the only request I had, because I won't be there on the 12th, and I didn't want to miss that workshop. So um, the second um, option number two would be a school board meeting on July 12th, facilities the 19th, school board August 9th, facilities the 23rd, school board the 13th and um, school board on the 27th which either I would assume if we had those late then maybe the facilities workshop could be combined or unless you want to do it a separate day could be combined on the second school board meeting on September 27th and that will give you two school board meetings in uh, September along with in the middle the um, district overview for the uh, school board facility uh, fiscal advisory committee and then we could do the facilities workshop with the school board on our, on September 27th if everybody is agreeable to that Jane I know in July we're going to be discussing the unreserved fund balance does it matter to you whether that would be the 12th or 19th would you be ready on the 12th if we were to consider flipping it because I know that's an important item that will come up at that meeting Sorry. Uh, yes, I will. Um, I believe we'll be ready. Uh, you know, we may be off a little bit once the auditors go through and they make their adjustments, but enough to be close enough to make some decisions. We can do it. So, um, I'm going to be honest. I, I'm kind of confused now that after all this discussion. Um, can we? Is there any way we can agree on a July and August time frame and then by July have September, October, November? Because I'll be honest, I don't love having 
a school board meeting the same night as a state primary and a general election, especially if there's a potential where West may be hosting an election. Um, I think that. that would be bad news for us. Um, that would not work out. So I think, is there a way we could just do like maybe July, August, September, and then maybe come back to this? No. What about, what if we just focus on the school board and facility and then take the, the fiscal advisory and put it on its own schedule. We usually do school board first and then fiscal advisory after that, and I think that will clear things up a little better. And then the um, you know, primary night and election night, we should probably move those just so that there's uh, ample opportunity for the public to come to our meetings if they want to. And I think we can just slide those down. Um, or the September one, we can move to the 6th. We usually don't have a meeting right after Labor Day, but in this case, it's probably warranted. and we would know right away if there are any issues with enrollment or anything like that. So that's so I propose um, to change the September 13th to September 6th. And then the November 8th to the 15th. And then I think the rest of the school board Schedule is fine. The facilities is fine. We can we can say that the the facilities for September is is um, to be determined after the July one week or yeah after the August one we can say yeah we probably need another hour of discussion or two hours or eight hours who knows what happens by then. Um, so I would just leave the rest of it and then we'll talk about fiscal advisory later. And can I suggest uh, with the uh, could we if you're going to do the um, school board on the 15th of November. Uh, would you want to do the uh, fiscal advisory on that Monday the 7th? Okay, so we'll, we'll move, uh, we'll make um, school board on November, um, Tuesday, November 15th. We will make fiscal advisory on November, um, that would be November 7th. So what are people's thoughts on just focusing for now on the summer schedule of July and August when the times, the dates of the school board meeting and the facilities workshops? So I don't understand what, I, I guess I've missed something except for that we're adding facilities meetings in there, but we have a, we have a plan of when school board meetings are. So I don't know why we're, I don't know what, I don't know why we're questioning that. I guess I missed something. David's request is option two, that we do a school board on July 12th and a facilities on July 19th, and then a school board on the 9th, and a facilities on the 23rd. That's that's the only because right. it was one I of those. I just didn't know why we were focusing on all all these other months, like except for with the election. I understand that that's a concern. Oh, I was just asking your question, asking about July and August. Okay. <laughs> I think we're all on the same page. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So are people okay with swapping the two July dates? Okay, so Austin, you can swap the two July dates, so the school board meeting will be the 12th and the facilities would be the 19th. Perfect. And, and are people okay with the August dates? Okay. So we should probably make a motion to accept just July and August for now. And do we need? It's, li it's listed as an action item. So would someone like to make that motion to approve the summer schedule? I'll make the motion, but I don't have the dates. I was gonna ask for an updated calendar to be emailed to us. <laughs> July 12th for a school board meeting, July 19th for a facilities workshop, July 9th for a facility, August 9th for a facilities workshop, August 23rd nope. for a school board oh, meeting. Nope. August 9th, uh, July 12th and August 9th school board. Oh, yeah, okay. July 19th and August 23rd facilities. Okay. So moved. Second. Eight, first by John and a second by Derek. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. So it would be helpful in the future to let's keep facilities on its own separate calendar just because it's a lot of dates and it's a lot to keep track of and we will definitely revisit this and find a time for facilities workshop come the fall. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Yikes. 
So our next item is the facility is the facilities maintenance plan. Okay, the um, this facilities maintenance plan is part of one of the requirements that Eric reviewed in his presentation, and this was part of the school building aid requirement uh, that um, was based off a template that the state puts out for school districts. Um, Jeremy uh, created this document, again, following the, the baseline of what the state put out. It aligns with what our custodial services are going to be, uh, security, um, updating and maintenance, what our maintenance preventative plans are. Um, it's an entire document that um, was actually a, a good exercise in making sure that we are aligned with what the plan would be. Uh, also refers to how we handle energy management, what our processes are for uh, repair orders for um, maintenance items that recur each year. So um, this is a document that was required and it will be updated as necessary, whether it's Jeremy uh, changes a process that he may do, he may update this during the year, but it will definitely be reviewed yearly and we'll bring it back to the board if there are any changes made at that time. I'm not sure if the, I know the state requires that both myself, Marianne, and uh, the board chair, Erica, signs it, uh, but I ask, I'm not gonna ask if the board can actually approve it so that just in case it does require a board vote. Um, and we will upload this with the rest of the documents tomorrow once we have the, I did sign um, a copy over there and Marianne's signing as well. If we could have um, Erica sign at the end of the night. If, does anybody have any questions on the overall maintenance plan? I read the, uh, it's uh, the entire document because I did. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very detailed and it's uh, comprehensive and everything. The only question I had is that there was, uh, and this is uh, probably a minor issue, but the only question I had was that um, there was a, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a uh, procedure that was outlined that if a custodian calls in sick, um, they were to be asked what the reason was that they were out. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that, you know, if they, if they call in and say they're out because their car's broken down or something as opposed to being ill, but I don't know if we ask them if we uh, have the ability or the authority to ask them about specific health issues or injuries as far as HIPAA is concerned. That's my only concern. We don't ask custodians if they are out for a general sickness. We don't ask them to give detail on that. I think that the intent of that was if a custodian called out sick, was it possibly related to a workplace injury or something like that? That's kind of what I is. assumed, but yes. I just want to make sure. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for qu asking the question. Marianne, did you have something to say about this? No, I think... I think it's very, very well done. Table of contents, everything. I would just, um, I think we just need a date on the front cover. There is a date um, within plan. Was that last reviewed and updated on June 14th, 2022? I just, we could just put a date on the front cover. That'd be great. I just think that, uh, in fact, I know that um, Jeremy and Jane put a tremendous amount of work into this. So I'd like to thank both of them. They really did an exceptional job. And I want to thank you for all that work and hours you put in and all the editing you did as well. So I'll make a motion to approve the Dairy Cooperative School District Facility Maintenance Plan, and then I'll have something for discussion. And is there a second? Okay, Brenda seconded it, and Derek, you have yeah. this? Uh, this is an amazing document. I think um, I'm kind of a policy and procedure goofball because I write them for work all the time for clean rooms and compounding pharmacies and everything and this is as detailed as what I would have to put together to satisfy FDA requirements and State Board of Pharmacy requirements. Um, I would say that this sh should be available in every school for the maintenance staff to thoroughly understand and they should read it as part of their training and sign that they've read it because uh, it's always something they can go back to and say well, what was I supposed to do on the daily what was I supposed to do on the monthly um, 
and it's then there's no questions or it's very easy for them to get an answer and not have to bother administration or something. So that would just be my only recommendation. Uh, sorry, just to add on to that. So I know we use School Dude as a facilities maintenance tool. Do we house this facility or we will we be housing the facilities maintenance plant in School Dude and utilizing the work order system to make sure that things are kept up to date? Is that how we will be? Is that the plan? Uh, well, we currently use um, School Dude for all work order um, documents, so the the plan will just be part of, part of that. We also have um, maintenance called Maintenance Direct. We have work orders, so they can put in you know when boilers have to come up for cleaning and things like that. So yes, that will be part of the plan. School Dude, as funny as the name is, is actually a really great work order tracking software, and um, it, there were hundreds of open work items before Jeremy came to the district, and at any given time, there are just a handful of them open. So kudos to Jeremy, first of all, on the maintenance plan. He did an amazing job, and to the, main, the whole maintenance department for the amount of work that they do with the work orders in the district. Thank you. So are people, do people have any more comments, or are they ready to vote? So. All in favor of the facility maintenance plan? Opposed? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I know this is a, for the benefit of the public. It's a thick document. It's a lot of work. And it will definitely help us stay on track. So thank you very much. So our next item, also Jane, is the summer maintenance projects. OK. I'm going to quickly roll through this. Uh, as we get to the end of the year, at the last board meeting, I did talk about having uh, what we propose will be a healthy, unreserved fund balance. And uh, we did have some projects in the works that we are actually going to expend out of this current fiscal year. Uh, not unlike things that we would do in any other year, but knowing that we um, have the funds that we're able to expend, we are going to, we're going to move forward with the water project for Grinnell. That is um, 159,000 and again that went out to bid with the town on all, all of their water projects um, that's the project that we've been working on for a couple of years and they will be tying off onto Hood Road and Jeremy's been working closely with our town counterparts on that project um, and not only will it be 160000 for that, but Jeremy will also contract with a plumber because he's got to do the internal connectivity. We also have some other projects uh, that Jeremy's been working on, doing parking lot line striping, crack sealing, pavement repairs uh, at the school districts. Uh, Gilbert H. Hood has a catch basin replacement and a rebuild that has to be done um, prior to the next school year. We've also looked at a lot of flooring. I've mentioned it before when Jeremy is going around and, and uh, done maintenance assessments and again, as part of a facility plan, but prior to the facilities assessment being done, Jeremy had also go on, gone around to every room in every hallway in the district and he rated all of the flooring. So he has a, a scoring system so that he knows when he goes to budgeting that he takes all of the areas that are a one, and that means that they're a high need to be replaced. So again, he's gone through. We went out to bid, and we are doing um, flooring uh, replacements with VCT and uh, rubber flooring, and we will be taking care of those out of this fiscal year. Um, along with that, as you know, some of our schools require um, a asbestos abatements. He's estimating that's approximately just for the abatement alone is about 15,000. So when we look at where we spend our funds for flooring replacement, you can obviously get more done, when, more on the rooms that don't, don't require the abatements. Um, West Running Brook Middle School here needs sprinkler piping replacement. That's about estimated 20,000. Also here at West Running Brook, um, Jeremy wants to have the elevator controls upgraded. It's actually required um, and so that's again another estimated 20,000 there are other areas where he's looking at the school district for 
um, safety inspections and areas, the bleachers, playgrounds, um, the kitchen hood suppression, areas in the building that um, he would normally be doing with the summer that he's starting on now. Um, and that is it for the estimated projects. But these in total will be taken out of this fiscal year. So it comes to about 400,000 this fiscal year. Um, also, there is a section, I apologize, I left this part out, he told me earlier today, there is a section of Gilbert H. Hood roofing, it's a very small dollar amount, but it's about 8,000. Okay, so those are projects that, um, that he's going to be working on. Just to give a note, I know that some people have asked, you know, could we do bigger projects at this point in the year? Uh, he's struggling to get people to bid. So for example, for the carpet and floor replacement, uh, we only received two bids. And Jeremy, they posted on our website. He um, researches vendors and reaches out to them. They email them, let them know that we have projects, and um, only to actually put in a bid. So much like any other business, we're struggling to find contractors and vendors who are willing to bid and do the work. So that's all I have for that one. Does anybody have any questions on the summer projects? I don't have a question, but I just want to thank both you and Jeremy for putting work into getting some of those bids and making that list because we definitely have a lot of maintenance needs in this district and using some of the money that we do have unspent definitely will put us in a better position by fixing those things before they need more costly repairs. So thank you both. So our next item is the B business administrator's update. Okay, I am going to do this one quickly. I want to update you on the um, Conval project. I know that we've talked about that before, but I um, recently have been requested, I don't know that I've had an official subpoena, but I think it is, um, that I'm being deposed on July 28th on behalf of the school district um, with regards to the Conval lawsuit. I am hopefully meeting with um, attorney Michael Tierney of Wadley Star and Peters, who is um, the one representing this project on behalf of all of the, the districts. So um, I have been assured that we will meet so that I know what information that I will be presenting in my deposition. I also would like to um, update the board. You, maybe everybody has seen it um, on the news, but that the, the Joint Legislative Fiscal Committee uh, last Friday approved the New Hampshire Department of Ed's request for um, $10 million that would go to uh, continue making security improvement for all schools in the state. Um, it is part of the American Rescue Plan um, Act. They estimate that majority of schools would somewhere be in the range of forty dollars to $50,000 for school safety initiatives. Um, they have not put out the application process yet, it, but once they do, I, much like every other school, does not want to miss this grant opportunity, so we will be applying. We um, already know areas in which we want to apply for in the grant, and I will keep, uh, keep the board updated on that as soon as the grant application um, is available. And of course, we hope that Derry is on the high side of what they estimate, and hopefully $50,000 um, and we can put that money to good use to do some security improvements in our district. So I just wanted to update you with that. Um, I recently secured the dates for our pre-audit, which is going to be on um, July 18th. And our full audit is going to be August 29th because that's very convenient to have a full audit when <laughs> school is back. So, um, so there's that. Yes. So um, n again, that is pre-audit of this year, full audit, does not include the four other audits that we're also going through. So if you can keep track of all those, <laughs> good luck. Um, and that is all I have for an update. Thank you very much, Jane, and we appreciate all your work on all those audits. That is a lot of auditing and paperwork we are generating.
thanking us for the retiree celebration and we also got a letter from Red Star Productions, it's the Dairy Twirlers, thank you, letting us know that the, the custodial staff at West Running Brook did a terrific job, specifically Ed Shea, Matt Foster, and Ron Gould, if you're out there, in helping them set up and being available, as well as, I don't want to leave anyone out, and I know I'm leaving someone out, as well as Polly and Beland for setting up all the dates and information. So it's really nice to hear that our staff are being helpful both in school and for other events. So that is what I've got for correspondence. Our next item is the Pinkerton Academy contract agreement, and I'm going to pass that one to Derek. Thank you, Erica. Mr. Minkle, do you have that presentation available to us? All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we wanted to go over the uh, Pinkerton Academy tuition agreement. Um, I don't think this has ever been done in public, so I wanted to do that this year and people uh, can understand what this agreement is with our district in Pinkerton. So the uh, relationship began many, many years ago. The, I believe the first actual contractual relationship started in 1962, but many years prior to that we've utilized Pinkerton services. Uh, we have a it's it's a 20-year contract that auto renews every five years uh, so if you do nothing it just keeps going um, the present contract was last revised at the last five-year interval which was in 2017 and part of that contract um, there's only two ways to change it either at before march 30th of the renewal year you notify pinkerton that you're not going to renew the contract or before January 30th of the renewal year, both parties agreed to language changes. So that's where we started last year, uh, probably in July. Um, we first we sent our first proposal to Pinkerton as for language changes. And the first one here is uh, section three, which is enrollment outside of the academy. And I wanna thank uh, Jane for putting the contract on the uh, district website. It's And it's directly under the school board tab. Um, so the full contract is there for you to peruse. Um, so this, uh, currently the agreement, uh, th we wanted to look at the uh, enrollment outside of the academy just because we um, we understand that there's this new, new freedom of choice available out there. The pandemic has brought new choices for kids to do uh, virtual schools. Um, and then we know that some of our population uses Next, but um, Next enrollment is limited. Um, so potentially there are other uh, schools that could offer availability to us um, that may be either smaller or are designed in a format that's best for that student. Um, you know, not necessarily that Pinkerton can't do, um, can't do something for them, but there may be other venues that offer something more for that child that the parents may deem needed. So currently it's, we're allowed to send up to 10% of dairy high school students um, to other high schools. Um, and this does not include next because next is parental choice. Um, so out of the current about 1,500 enrolled, we could potentially send 150 students to other schools um, that may have room for us. This is only if Pinkerton enrollment stays at 20, at least 2,500. If it falls below that, then um, we can't send that 10% away. So we had put in um, a request to increase that amount to 30%, uh, hoping that we could negotiate somewhere in between. Um, we currently don't utilize um, anywhere near the 10%, and, and that was kind of Pinkerton's response to us as well, you're not using it anyway, so we're not gonna increase it. Um, so as part of that, I think what I would like to do at some point in the future is uh, have a discussion with the board about um, surveying our families in town and just seeing if there is any interest. Maybe there's no interest to go elsewhere. You know, maybe, um, or maybe uh, a teacher at, um, and, and who lives in another district would like to have their children in that district for whatever reason. Uh, but potentially surveying our families in town and just seeing, are you interested in exploring other schools? Do they have other schools in mind? Um, just get an idea of the lay of the land and then we could potentially move forward from there. If we utilize the 10% and we need more, then I think if we go back to Pinkerton, they might be more interested in discussing that further. But since we don't utilize it, then they weren't um, interested in giving us any further. Um, and then the next slide, section five, is the district and board of trustee meetings. Um, 
So currently, the board of trustees is made up of um, multiple members from each of the sending towns. I believe Derry still has the greatest number of trustees just because we have the greatest number of students, but I'm not positive about that. Um, that's changed over time and not really sure where the total numbers are. Um, we currently don't have any um, members that are that are directly from the school board. We have residents of Derry on the board of trustees, but no school board members. So um, we had proposed adding a member of the board of trustees that would be appointed by the Derry school board. Uh, that is similar to what we do with next charter school. We have um, two members. One is a voting member, one is a non-voting member, and also the superintendent is a member of that board. Um, so we figured we would request this, um, that we're, we still make up nearly half of Pinkerton's um, enrollment. Uh, the campus is in our town. Um, we would like to have greater insight into Pinkerton's workings, um, help build a closer relationship. We can offer suggestions on things. Um, Pinkerton was not willing to offer us a, a spot on the board of trustees. Um, they um, noted that the director of charitable trusts, um, they publish a handbook every year that talks about um, the requirements for a trustee. Um, and they deemed that um, the duty of loyalty would not allow a school board member to be on their board of trustees because our interest would be with the town and the district and not with Pinkerton. Um, our attorney reached out to this actual director and they said that they would not have an issue with that whatsoever. Um, so Pinkerton still declined to offer us a seat, even a non-voting seat, um, so we didn't get that um, language change. Next slide, please. This is a continuation of section five. We wanted to hopefully have a member of the Board of Trustees or a designee from Pinkerton to come to at least one of our fiscal advisory committee meetings and our public budget hearing. In the past, um, I think it's probably been three or four years now, um, the headmaster would typically come uh, to the budget hearing at least in January and, and describe um, their budget or if maybe certain projects that were going on at Pinkerton. Um, that hasn't happened for several years. Um, we, we would request that they had come to our fiscal advisory so they could kind of understand the, our, our pains and what we're doing. Um, we don't really have any insight into their financials, so if the public asks us a question about their budget, we can't answer it. So it would be great if they were there um, at the hearing um, or even at the fiscal advisory, if there were fiscal advisory members that had questions, that they could actually answer those questions and not have to get back into a, you know, a letter writing contest or something. Um, at the end of the discussion on this, um, the current president of the Board of Trustees did offer a verbal offer um, to have a sending town public meeting to describe their budget. So hopefully they stick to that in this fall. There will be a meeting open to the public for all of the towns that go to Pinkerton um, to ask questions about their budget. All right. Uh, section nine is the construction and planning committee. Uh, so this is part of the contract that uh, if any expenditure is greater than $750,000 in capital expenditures, um, that triggers a part of the contract that requires a planning committee to be developed. Uh, that's composed of four Pinkerton trustees, two Pinkerton administrators, two school board members from each sending town, and then two superintendents throughout the sending towns that are chosen by the towns. Um, so we proposed um, to change this, uh, to increase it first of all to a million dollars, just because over time this number has never changed, but also make it a voting uh, method from the towns so that there, right now there's really no checks and balances. That committee, whatever they come up with, if they say we don't like the project, we don't want you to build a building, they can override it and just say, well, thanks for your time, but we're gonna do it anyway. Um, so we came up with the idea of having, you know, we'll, we'll increase the amount so it's not, you're not coming to us every time there's something going on, um, but it would be voted on by the district, the sending districts as to eventually how we're going to pay for their budget. Um, they declined that option to us, saying that they would not then have any control over how they would budget. Um, 
you know, our feeling was, at least in our district, I don't know about any other sending town districts, but we have a difficult tough time. We've talked about this about maintenance, and usually that's the first thing we cut here. Um, so we'd like to have some say over their maintenance and their building. Um, so if we had a, a, a project lined up that we needed roofs um, and we needed to bond it or we couldn't bond it, we had to pay for it, um, that we didn't want to get double hit that year if, if Pinkerton was doing a project. So unfortunately, they did not agree to that. Uh, section 11, I'm going to let uh, my associate David here work on this one. All right, Section 11A is the accounting requirement. So currently in the agreement, there Pinkerton is required to give us an itemized accounting. And if you saw what it was, it really doesn't really add much value. All it is is a list of expenses. You don't see revenue. You don't see a balance sheet. You don't see bond, bond information. So with that being said, we, one of our meetings we discussed, you know, let's look at the 990s, which is public information, and it gives a lot of great detail. So after one of the meetings, one of our internal committee meetings, I pulled the three years I had access to um, with the IRS. They're both they're a few years behind and backlogged. And then you know I will say Adam Adam Mead, the the um, treasurer, helped me out with the next three years. So I have a five year five year look back from 15 to 20. Fiscal year 20 ended last 631 630 2021, and and our request was to have the 990s as part of the accounting submission um, each year. And, and their response was, well, that's public information. You know, there's no really need to amend the agreement. Well, I would argue, yeah, it's public information, but it's backlogged. So when something is submitted to the IRS or something is submitted to a third party website, you don't have access to it for maybe a year after it's submitted. So that, but I will say, like I said, Adam was very accommodating, Adam Mead, and, and he offered the 2021, so I, I don't see a problem with him continuing that trend as we move forward. J just so you know, the 990, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a nonprofit that required to file this with the IRS. It's a very detailed form. It gives you a balance sheet, gives you a P&L, um, gives you top wage earners for the organization. Um, there's bond information in there. There's, um, you know, donations and... and um, um, yeah, so that, that it's it's a very pretty comprehensive thing, and and you really get a good sense of what their financial position is, and it's all public, so it's not anything anything you guys you want to look at, you know, you can get it, or we'll give it to you. So that was that was that, and 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 the reason for the request was there's been some you know the prior years we haven't been getting the information that's been required, so we we made it a priority to ask about it, and um, you know. You know, moving forward, hopefully, we'll be we'll be in better shape to get that information from them. If not, we'll we'll keep on you know keep keep on them to do that. Um, and then the second part here, the tuition calculation. And as I've, I think most people realize is you know as as a public uh, public school here, we're required to calculate our our um, special ed with our with our costs. And when Pinkerton publishes their information that's excluding special ed. And I think that's pretty pretty well known. So I, our request was to when to do that calculation for us, they include the special ed piece with that. And um, you know, they weren't very accommodating with that request, saying we should be able to calculate it ourselves simply with the numbers that we've been doing. So that's kind of where we're at there. Um, I, I think just my own personal, you know, being new to the committee and trying to come in with an open mind to the process. Um, you know, we did talk about being more of a partnership in the process. And there was a sense you could see maybe we can get there and um, it would be more incremental than, um, you know, all up front. So we'll see how that goes as we move forward beyond, you know, our meetings with the trustees and, and, and moving forward. So hopefully that will stand, stand true. I'm hopeful for that, and we'll see what happens in the uh, future. Our terms, and then 14 contract language change. So terms, currently the contract, again, like I said in the beginning, is a 20-year term. It automatically renews every five years unless prior to March 30th, you give notice that the district will not extend that contract. If you do that, that basically means you are ending your term at Pinkerton approximately 15 years later. So um, once that goes into effect, you know, it, wheels are going to start moving pretty fast on both sides. Uh, we would have to build a high school 
they would have to figure out what they want to do for revenue at 15 years of loss of about half of their population. So those things aren't going to, they're not going to wait. Well, we'll wait another five years and figure out what we're going to do. Both sides are going to move pretty darn quick after that. Um, we propose to change that to a 10 year term, uh, tightening things up a little bit. Um, Hooks it was allowed into Pinkerton with a 10 year um, term agreement. Uh, so we said we would like to have the same terms as Hooks it. Um, they declined that and basically said that it would materially alter the contract's economics and intent, basically saying they would have less stability over time, maybe not getting as good of a bond rating or potentially financing. Um, and then they cited back to us that other towns have actually increased their terms. So Hampstead used to be 10 years, they went to 20 years. So we were kind of stuck with that. Um, the, the only other, again, method to change the contract is prior to June 30th of the renewal year, both parties must agree and ratify any language changes prior um, in that term. So there's, there's no um, signing of the contract. You either non-renew it or you both agree to make a language change and then you would have to um, sign the contract. So this year, uh, there will be no signing because there's no contract changes. So, <laughs> And then section 20, the contract dispute. Again, this is language that was in the Hooksit agreement. Our current language states that any contract disputes first have to go to the state commissioner of education, um, who probably is someone that doesn't really want to hear uh, contract disputes. Um, so we wanted to put in the language um, currently says shall go to the state. We wanted to change that to may. So it would offer us the availability of the court system. Um, and most likely the commissioner would find that much easier to deal with. Um, that is also out of the hooks at agreement. This we're still waiting for them to come back to us to um, potentially agree to. Um, we have not heard back from them on that yet. So kind of overall Pinkerton's proposals, um, they did verbally offer to hold a public sending town meeting to explain their budget. Uh, they're getting back to us on the contract dispute language. Um, they did request to us, their only request, was to remove the out of district tuition cap. So I didn't go over that, but um, we currently are the only sending district left that um, has a cap that Pinkerton cannot have more than 75 students from outside of this district paying tuition into the school. Um, they really didn't use that leverage to negotiate any other points. They just simply asked for it. We said no. Um, you know, hopefully we were hoping that you know we could leverage that a little bit. The, I think the last time we did go from 50 to 75. I don't know if they even used that, um, but we could have easily gone higher than that. Um, but since they weren't really willing to work with us on any other points, we decided to decline that as well. So um, my overall impressions, um, you know, I think our, our requests were very reasonable. Um, if you look at any other relationships between institutions and businesses and vendors and, you know, it, it, they seem very reasonable in nature. Um, I think over time it would strengthen the relationship where there's been a lot of animosity, I think, at the board level. Um, but I do want to say that at the administrative level, um, there's great cooperation, great relationships, um, great um, understanding of, of um, curriculum and how the curriculum can change and how it can improve and, and better in intertwine with Pinkerton um, and understanding what, what Pinkerton would like to see out of our students when they get there. So there's tremendous efforts there. I don't want to diminish how the education process works between the two of us. I think that's that's very spot on. There can always be little changes here and there, and, and they've certainly improved their special education offerings with the NECC. Uh, there's more work to be done there, but otherwise, um, you know, again, the educational perspective is, is spot on. It's really the board level, um, and a lot of it is financial, of course, and anytime you have a relationship, financials tend to be the biggest issue between the two parties, so. Um, I would say that also that Pinkerton is very gracious to its community. I don't want this presentation to seem like it's a negative, um, all of it. Uh, like I said, the, the, admit, the educational piece is, is good in working with our administration. Um, our elementary schools get to use their amazing facilities for talent shows. Uh, the middle school um, has graduations. Uh, middle school sports are allowed to use their fields because we don't have fields that we can use and we, they even allow us to use their equipment. Um, the dairy community is, can use their fields in several um, uh, 
groups around town will be able to use their facilities. So, you know, they're they're a good partner to the community. Is there some value added? Um, but we would like to see that relationship maybe tighten up a little bit, um, <clears throat> become a little less, you know, have a little less animosity, a little more trusting, um, and just having us kind of involved a little more with that. Um, right now, that that's not going to happen this year. Um, but I think over time, I think we we overcame a good amount of tension um, over the past several months of negotiating and just actually just meeting. There really wasn't much negotiation, but just meeting and talking. Um, I think it was very positive. Um, we got a lot of financial, thanks to David, he got a lot of financial data out of them. Um, like he said, you know, the 990s are public, but the IRS is backlogged on putting them up on websites. They gave them to us. Um, so there, there's an olive branch, you know, kind of on both sides going out there. So we hope in the future that that just grows and um, you know, we'll, get, we'll get there at some point. Um, but uh, so th that's the presentation. I want to thank uh, Mr. Minkle for uh, running the slideshow for me. And uh, I'll we'll take uh, questions or comments from board or public or however Eric wants to do it. I first just wanted to thank Brenda, David, and Derek all for your time for all those meetings and preparation for them. Committee meetings happen at various times during the week and during the day, but there's a lot of preparation just to attend those meetings. So all three of you, thank you for your effort there. I'll extend that thanks to Mr. Perkins too, because he was on the committee for the first half of our meetings and uh, we appreciate all his work that he put in. And Lynn, thank you for all your efforts on this. So at this time, I will let members of the board ask any questions they have. And after members of the board ask questions, I'll welcome members of the public to ask questions. I um, th thank you to the people who were involved in this. This I know it was a tremendous amount of work, and you worked very hard. And I think that not only do we appreciate that, but members of the community should appreciate that too. Um, I, at the risk of destroying or damaging the goodwill that Mr. Anderson talked about, I'll reserve my comments about my inward feelings at this point when we get to negotiations that categorically get turned down, no, no, for no reason, because we can. But I want to just leave the public, people who are here right now, as well as people who are at home who may listen to this. One item that Mr. Anderson mentioned, that the reason that they were concerned about not having a school board or a school district member on the board is because they're more concerned about loyalty to the academy than they are about the mission of the school district and the education of kids. So I just want to make sure that of all the things he mentioned, you remember that. Thank you. Are there any other members of the board that have any questions or comments about the presentation before I open it up to the public? Um, I don't, I don't, it's not really about the contract, but um, recently was reached out to about the relationship that we have with Pinkerton. Um, and one suggestion was inviting Pinkerton to attend, um, similar to how we do like a, our school presentations, whether it's Grinnell or any other elementary school or middle school, um, inviting Pinkerton to come do that along with having the Pinkerton liaison. Um, I don't know if that's something that we've offered in the past, um, but I think that would be great for them if they brought, um, if we scheduled like one of our meetings and we gave them 15 to 30 minutes just like we do to our K through eight schools and had students here um, and talk to them because, or talk to us, uh, I think I, I know I hear this a lot. Um, I moved to Derry because of Pinkerton. Um, and I think that's probably a big reason why they come into negotiations and feel the way that they do. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, we talk, uh, there's a 10% threshold. I'd love to know like the numbers, uh, how out of 150 students that we could send, is it, well, yeah, I, I know there wasn't a high utilization there, but is that like 10 students or is that like 75 and it's growing? Um, I think those are things to certainly look at and see what kind of trends we can um, see, but yeah, I mean, I, I think transparency, uh, we get asked about that all the time as well. I think that's probably what we're looking for um, is just continued partnership, transparency, um, because they do a lot of great things. Um, and I, I think we as a district do a lot of great things and 
we can all continue to improve as well. So um, the other piece topic that came up uh, in that conversation was um, the, uh, I'm trying to think of the showings of like Pinkerton events, whether those are graduations or plays or concerts. I know we do that for our K through eight schools. Um, wondering what would be entailed to make that happen. I know they have um, their website as well that they post a lot of their live streams and uh, different events as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's things that we can all continue to do a little bit better to get better that relationship, both from a contract standpoint, but also other things as far as inviting them um, to meetings, uh, showcasing their, their uh, the great things that they do as well, recognizing the great teachers and students that they have there as well. So um, yeah, it, it sounds like we have it. We have a great, uh, great relationship from an administrative standpoint. Um, obviously, Austin, we're going to count on you to continue that as well as Joe as well and anyone else in the administration. So um, yeah, I, th I think, I mean, all positive things. Uh, I don't think I would say this, I don't think this was that uh, that negative of a presentation. So thanks for putting this together, Derek and David and Brenda. Erica, I'm not sure that the general public knows about the ability to go to a different school and what that process is, right? I mean, they know that we have next because we highlight that and they know that automatically the students go to Pinkerton. They don't know that there's a process for them to go to a different high school um, or a different charter school if that's their choice. And maybe we need to do a better job of letting people know what that process is because they can't just show up at Salem High School or Alvern High School on the first day of school and say, hey, I've decided I live in Derry, but I've decided to come here. There's a process, right? So um, I, think, I think we need to do a better job of making sure people know that that's available to them. If there's some place that's better fit for their student or their child or their young adult um, and what that process is. I think it's great that this presentation has resulted in a lot of discussions about one, ways we can talk about what Pinkerton's doing and bring them in, but also ways hopefully we can reach out to them and get a better handle on what the relationship involves and continue the discussion. If no other board members have comments at this point, I would welcome members of the public to come up and ask questions about this presentation. I would just ask, as usual, that you state your name and address for the record. sit in the cushion chair right now. Um, I'll try to speak passively. There's some things here I'm sure all of you know that I'm probably not very appreciative of the outcome, but I understand uh, the process. Hey, Lynn, before and, you. Uh, for Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Perkins, for Woodland Street, right? Okay. But understanding the process and the work that you have put into it and followed up after my uh, absence um, is also appreciated. It is a difficult task to work with this group of individuals. But, uh, you know, let me just say this. Uh, if you look at the his history, the historians of the district, um, Brenda, Derek, you know, those who have walked this line prior at some time, um, there are important aspects that this contract focused on, and that was the academics and the students uh, and what they're getting out of this, correct? Um, the contract is established at 2,500 students, and that was established quite a long time ago before Pinkerton continued to grow. When you expand that campus to the size it is, you diminish student fulfillment and student opportunity. Uh, whether it's sports or band or whatever, you create a smaller opportunity for the students who reside in Derry and don't have that opportunity um, elsewhere. As they continue to invite other districts in to build the campus without our permission, um, without our input, all well, they get our input, but then the contract stipulates that the trustees hold the ultimate decision that really isn't very beneficial to this town or this district. Those are the things that, that were the driver to the developments that you've asked for or have worked on and that we asked for last July that I put together and, uh, and Derek had um, edited. We look for faculty engagement. Um, 
And that is one of the things that frequently from not just our district, as I've heard input from the histor historical aspects, and I go out to the public, I hear faculty engagement from, for the students is an issue. Guidance support is an issue. And it's not just from students and parents in this town, it's from the collaboration that I initiated when I was chair and worked on with the other sending districts that are going to Pinkerton. These were common things that happened and that's what the focus of this, where this starts from and that is giving opportunity to students and an opportunity to go elsewhere. To think that this entity up at the top of the hill is saying to you right now, no, you cannot send more than 90% of your students you, you can only send 90% of your students, you can't send more than 10% out unless we give you permission. When the contract is established at 2,500 people, this is absurd. And that in and of itself should make you say, we're not signing this contract. I understand the contract language is perpetual, but without the signatures of four of the members of this board, that does not obligate you to continue to stay there. And this is a, an offense that is remedied in the courts despite the writing of this contract and is testable, and Pinkerton knows this. So if you do not want to continue to diminish the student opportunity going to high school without having a say, I will tell you that in this current fiscal year, when we established this budget, I made sure that there was accountable funds there to do just that. And with the amount of money that is due back to this district, unexpended funds, you certainly have that right and that ability to do this. To have some other entity outside of the Commissioner of Education, which by the way, on my own dime, says the Commissioner of Education, despite what this contract says, does not have the obligation or the legislative approval to be the judge and jury on this matter. This is about student achievement, student opportunity, not to mention the growth of the campus and now and now today, we have to question the safety and security of that campus. That also plays relevant to this student aspect. The concerns about the contract, and this is not the academics, but now the business of doing business. The concerns of contract fulfillment. It's very simple. You're obligated to send us something every October. Just send the damn document. If it's going to be in the 990 anyway, why make us wait one or two years if you're not going to offer us the information willingly and continue to dig your heels in when we ask, just send the document. And if you don't want to do that, then that is another offense that we should look at getting remedied. It is my understanding that this contract and the perpetual renewal cannot, is not something that can stand up. It is my understanding that fiscally, that entity on the Hill is using public funds. And the idea to the business of doing business is that every taxpayer, whether it's this town, Hooks at Auburn, Chester or Hampstead, or anywhere in between, has the right to know how that money is being spent and what is going on behind the curtain. There is case law building to this, and the Supreme Court of the United States is, is going to make a decision on something similarly close to this coming up in the next few weeks. Not identical to this. This gives you standing. This gives you standing to say, you know what, we're not going to do this with you anymore. I, I understand that when we have worked and negotiated and things got tense with Pinkerton over the last several months, that this kind of is one of those things that, okay, fine, you, you're giving us a little bit. The president of the trustees says he'll have a question and answer tonight so that, so that the boards, by the way, not just this board, but the similar complaints from Auburn and Chester, is that they don't want to be blindsided by decisions that Pinkerton makes at the last minute and having to explain those decisions to the taxpayers. They want Pinkerton to decide that. And by the way, what's the litmus test and the barometer of this? The litmus test and barometer is that the only other academy in this state offers, uh, operates con 
completely the way I am describing they should. An obligation to the taxpayers and to the parents and students to say to them, this is what we're doing, this is why, and this is open, as open as the public requires this board to be to them on their website. We want to be part of the long-term planning. We want to have a few voice in future development in the decision-making process. We have one conflict that was about whether or not Pinkerton was fulfilling their contract. We had two. And the first one built to the second one. And the question is whether or not they fulfilled their obligation when they built the road. The problem with the road off of Shinito is that during the sending town meetings, other people from other districts would, would ask questions and they'd get one answer and then later on that answer would change and it would evolve. And it goes to all those aspects that I'm sharing with you now under the caption of doing a business, doing the, the business of doing the business. Until you get a copy of that contract for that road, I would highly advise you not to sign this contract because that is public money and it should not be a secret. Lynn, can I ask that you wrap things up? You can come up again if someone, but I gave you a fair bit of extended time. You did, it was great. Thank you very much. I think I rest there and I appreciate everybody. And I, the work isn't easy and uh, took a lot of mind thought to putting that together. So thank you very much, I'll excuse myself, but please heed my advice. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I will just uh, wanted to say that uh, collaboration um, you had started quite a few years ago with other sending towns, and that's how I got some of the information I got for this contract. Um, that collaboration dried up in the past six months, and no other sending town was interested in working with us to move forward with this. So we did, you know, that's something that had never been tried before. It was something you started um, and nurtured, and um, you know, I did get a little bit of information out of other districts to, to for language and stuff, but then uh, none of their boards were interested in working with us. So. Bruce Kling for Village Brook Lane. So I must say I'm disappointed. Several of the items in Section 5 were things the Fiscal Advisory Committee has been uh, asking for. So I'm disappointed that they were, uh, Pinkerton said no. Um, I will say that when Mary Anderson was headmistress, I always went to her asking her for budget data and I always got it from her. Once she left, that all dried up. I don't know why. That, that change happened. Uh, relating to what Lynn said, um, the Northwest Public Safety Dispatch Center in Connecticut is a private entity that was receiving public funds. They claimed that they weren't subject to any of the um, right to know laws and making uh, their budget information available publicly. They were taken to court, they lost. And uh, so I think you have grounds by which to do that. Um, With regard to David on the Pinkerton on the published tuition rate, we, you know, Pinkerton says you can calculate it yourself. Fiscal Advisory Committee has been doing that for the last two years. We got a letter from Pinkerton this year objecting to how we did the calculation. So my guess is if we continue to do that, there's going to be some um, um, objections to it, um, given how they uh, reacted to the, to the letter. Um, the, I guess the main thing I have is I don't understand the, con the way this is done. I don't understand why the non-renewal date is before the deadline for the agreement to the contract language. I mean, there are things I may want to change in the contract. And if I don't get them, I would not want to renew. So I, I don't understand why the, the non-renewal date comes before the agreement date. And I guess in the next contract, I would argue to make to change that around. Because if we truly believe that some of these issues are important to us, um, that agreement should take place before the non-renewal deadline. So um, thank you. Thank you. Do any other members of the public have questions or comments about the Pinkerton contract?
Uh, good evening, everyone. Tom Carden to Cunningham Drive. I'm sorry, my notes are all over the place. I was only going to uh, say a couple of things, so I may be referring back and forth. Um, first of all, thanks for the presentation. I mean, this is great that we're able to, the public is able to, you know, at least talk to you guys about what's going on at Pinkerton, and that's something that obviously hasn't been done in the past. I want to thank you, and thank you guys for that worked on the uh, on the contract negotiations with them. I'm sure it wasn't the best. Uh, job in the world, but, um, you know, the, the high school, Pinkerton Academy in any high school is the most important part of a community. I mean, you know, it's like the, everything revolves around it. When I taught at Somerville High School in Massachusetts, I mean, everything revolved around that high school, and that high school was just, you know, was busy morning, noon, and night, seven days a week. And, you know, I, I guess the problem that I see is, is that they're not that good partners you know, with, with the town. Um, yeah, they do good things, and Derek, you mentioned they do some good things, and I, I agree with that, but um, one of my biggest problems is there's no, no public input. I mean, they don't have any meetings. We can't go and express what we want. I'm sure you guys can't either. I don't know if you, you yeah, Brenda, okay, Brenda answered my question. Um, you know, and they, they, should have, they should have a meeting for the public to, address the issues. I mean, even if they sit there and pretend to listen to us, I mean, it, it le which they probably would anyway, but I mean, it, at least they could, you know, the, that we could feel like we have some input and, and we don't. And that's one of the biggest problems that I've, I've had um, over the years with them. Um, you know, the fact that they won't let, that, that they won't let a school board member be on the committee because they won't be loyal to the Pinkerton board, um, that's outrageous. And I'm going to say that to Pinkerton, you know, trustees. That is an outrageous reason to not allow a school board member. You should want a school board member. You want their input. You want them to help you decide what's going on with, with, your, with your school. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, my notes are all over the place. Uh, but, you know, that basically sums up what I, what I want to say, you know. Um, I, I just wish there was, you know, that Pinkerton would be a much better partner for the, uh, for the town and, and work better with the, you know, with, especially with the school board so that, um, you know, so that we all have, have public input. But anyway, thank you. Just so you know, Tom, in full disclosure, the, the, the meetings we do have, we have four sending town meetings a year. They're quarterly. And I do not believe they're public. But we have four sending town meetings. All the sending town board members are invited, and they make presentations on various topics. Um, so that that is that's the general access we have. Okay. Just, just so people is, know, is, is the is the public allowed to go to those meetings? I'm honestly not sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't think so. so I mean, I'm, gonna, I mean, I'm just gonna. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I'm just gonna say that there's been a lot of discussion about that over the years because we do each. Well, we have a quorum there. I don't. I won't speak for the other towns, but we have a quorum there which makes it a public meeting. And there has been a lot of discussion about that. I don't know what would happen. They've all been virtual. They've not been in person since <laughs> 2020. Um, I don't know what would happen if people came. Yeah. Um, but we do have a, we have a quorum there, so they should be public meetings. And yeah. you should be able yeah, to ab go. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'd like to come and have a discussion with Pinkerton Academy like I can, I'll like I can have with, with this When board. we have one, I'll let you know. You can ride with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Cardinal, one of the reasons we had requested for them to come to more meetings was because sometimes when they only come to a couple, a meeting once every couple of years, there tend to, tends to be more fireworks, you know. And I think if they came more regularly, it would be, there'd be less anxiety and less, you know, emotion and more just what's, you know, what's the meat and potatoes of discussion. Um, and they didn't want to seem to believe in that. So that's, you know, we did try to, you know, push them to come to more um, quarterly. We started out with quarterly, and then we dropped it down to just fiscal advisory and, and public hearing, um, and they didn't want to come at all, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. And you know, I mean, it just, it just shouldn't be the way it is with, with our high school. I mean, it just, it just shouldn't be. You know, there should be much more cooperation, and you know, it's, it's an integral part of the town. It just, it just shouldn't be like this. Thank you. Thank you. Would, oh, Butch? Good evening, Butch W. Bowers Road. Um, as a graduate of Pinkerton Academy, I am extremely disappointed in Pinkerton. Um, you know, the, the whole loyalty aspect really, 
really gets at me. Um, the loyalty shouldn't be to Pinkerton Academy. Um, the loyalty should be to the students of Pinkerton Academy. That's what it's all about. And the fact that, just a little story, this past winter, there were some very, very unsafe walking conditions in Pinkerton. Um, and I received many photographs from, um, from my daughters and from other parents uh, regarding the, some of the conditions. And, and I, I passed that along to Pinkerton and was given the response of, well, they shouldn't be walking over there anyway. They need to walk over here. That, that's, that's unacceptable. And, and that just goes right in line with the, the mentality that Pinkerton has. You know, I, I, I was proud to go through Pinkerton. I, I, I learned a lot at Pinkerton. I was very prepared for college because of Pinkerton when I went there. I don't feel the same now. I don't feel as though the, that school uh, is looking out for the best interests of their students. And that's why I think it's important that, you know, our school board, our taxpayers have a say. And I'm just so sick and tired of hearing, well, it's the academy. We do what we want at the academy. Because that's their mentality. So I, 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 I encourage each and every single one of you up there to please do not give up, do not settle for, for anything less than what our students truly deserve. So thank you. Do any other members of the public have a comment specifically about the Pinkerton, or question specifically about the Pinkerton contract? Anyone? Richard. Uh, Richard Tripp, 44 Wyndham Road. I agree with Lynn, this is a very comfortable chair. <laughs> Much better than uh, Anyhow, uh, I want to thank the board for uh, giving this presentation. It's quite informative. Uh, I have to agree with Brenda on uh, page three where they're talking about sending uh, dairy students to other schools. I never heard of this. Does anybody, do you, have, you, have you ever had anybody ask to go to another school? I have had parents ask me about the process. Yeah. Not a lot, but I have. But, you know, well, if you don't know it's available, you know, I guess you would say, well, well, what, I don't know what you'd say. Uh, on page five, where you talk about PA offering to have a public meeting, do you know what they mean by public? Does it mean that you, they would be in, like, the gymnasium and they would be allowing people from the sending schools to be in the, in the gymnasium and listen? Yeah, they didn't give any specifics, but um, the, it was specifically asked, would it be open to the public? And they said yes. Well, that's, that's interesting because it's kind of like when President Clinton says, what well, depends on what the definition of is is, right? You know, so, you know, I, I, would, I would have asked what is the definition of public, you know, because, you know, they would probably say, well, you're here, and that's public, because this is a trustees meeting, and it's not a public event unless you have, you know, a number of people that, uh, uh, I thought it was interesting. Several times you spoke about problems with Pinkerton that you thought were legal issues and that uh, they don't have the authority to make, be making the decisions that uh, they're making. Uh, I know we used to have meetings town, the, the, the council, the, the school board, and the legislative used to have meetings where we could talk about things that, you know, we could possibly fix with some legislation. I haven't heard anything for a while on things that we could fix with legislation. You know, Rich, Rich, I mean, I can address that if you like. So we're going to have a meeting, the school board, town council, and invite the winners of the primaries to a meeting after September 13th. It's in the works. Oh, Just well, that's it. great. Kill six months. 
sorry, I couldn't be more accommodating. The, the yeah. town didn't want to meet earlier, so we're, we're, oh. we have to wait for them. Well, you know what? Uh, I believe you're a public body, and you can meet with the legislators on your own. You don't have to have the, the town. And, uh, you know, if, if you have issues that you want to be resolved, you know, uh, we, the current representatives, would love to know so that we could put some bills in. You know, if you just want to uh, say, oh, me, oh, my, you know, we can't do this because it's against the law. Well, that's the great thing about having 10 legislatures. You can change the law, right? Uh, As for the uh, uh, the board wanting a uh, a seat on the trustees, uh, Pinkerton trustees, you know, I can understand why uh, Pinkerton would not want to, would be unwilling to give you a a, a seat and a vote. Uh, I I think if they were if you were to ask them, uh, say well. We'll get it changed to where PA can have a seat on our board and a vote. You know, would you be willing to allow a, a PA trustee to sit on the board? It would, all it'd take is a change to the law. You know, would you be willing to have somebody from PA voting on what the school board does? Because that's basically what you're asking. You want a voice in what Pinkerton's doing. You know. I think the difference is they're not sending us a whole lot of money, right? Well, that's true. But they may have some ideas on how the, the education of the K through eight students in Derry could be improved. You know, and right now, since they have no voice and no vote, you know, there's no reason to even bring it up. Well, I think as I spoke, the administrations do have an excellent relationship and they do discuss curriculum to a great degree and have a pretty good understanding of what each side needs to accomplish. So I, oh. I think we're, again, the administrative piece is, you know, I think it's important as part of the contract for education, but I don't think that that's an issue to us. Yeah. And also our teach, our teach we have teams, teams of teachers that meet with Pinkerton teams yeah. of teachers. So there's definitely collaboration with yeah. curriculum and, um, what students need yeah. or what we could change, not just our school, but the other sending, yeah. sending towns as well. well that's and Richard, we also asked in previous years for a non-voting member to sit in their board meetings and that was also denied. That was denied. Well, that doesn't surprise me. But uh, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things, if you, if you want to build uh, rapport with Pinkerton, uh, you know, you, you've said that the, there were people there were suggestions that uh, Pinkerton has made that you've implemented, you know. Uh, that would be something that would be a, a thing that would build rapport is if you acknowledge that, uh, you know, uh, during, a, during a meeting with Pinkerton, you know, we were talking about things that we need done to improve education here in Derry. And uh, Pinkerton came up with the idea and we said, well, that's a great idea, you know. Let's do that. You know, so this is why we're doing this. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, we're showing that cooperation between the, the Derry Cooperative School District and Pinkerton is, is working. Uh, Richard, with, could you just wrap up your thoughts? I am giving people extended time tonight, but I am also watching the clock, and you did have... Oh, it's almost 10 o'clock. Well, it's past my bedtime. There anyone else that has anything about Pinkerton? If not, we will move on to committee's manifest approval. Actually, before we get to oh, that, sure. so um, I sit here and I listen. Um, again, appreciate what Derek and David and Brenda did um, with this presentation and what they do in the subcommittee. Um, when I hear one, two, three, four, five, about five or six people come up tonight and express some of their disappointments um, with uh, Pinkerton, I can't help but re be reminded of some of past board meetings where we sit here and hear about the disappointments about the K-8 education that um, that we've delivered as a district. And uh, I certainly don't want to be the one to hold the water for Pinkerton here, but 
they do a lot of good. Um, I, they, they uh, I, I wrote down this question, is perception reality? Is the perception that we're hearing tonight, is that reality? Um, and I would ask Mary Ann, and I would ask Allison, and um, I know Joe's in the audience, so I would ask him, I know he, he's uh, at next. Uh, is, that, is that the reality? Because if it is, I'm sitting here, and, and again, yeah, we are a, a school board that for the most part, people will say, well, we're only responsible for K through eight. We're not, we are responsible for K through 12. Um, and so that's, it's hard to hear these things and, and how much, I don't know, just, I'm just really disappointed to hear these things if, if they are in fact true. Um, so yeah, like if, if Marianne or Austin or Joe, if you have any insights that you guys can provide to say, hey, you know, like these are things that, I'm not saying that don't, that I'm, there are things that definitely need to be improved, but um, are these things that we're hearing tonight kind of, is that, is that 90 to 95 percent of the, the perception for our students and our families? Um, because again, I go back to that 10 percent threshold. If we're not even coming close to that, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, the, 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 the families in Derry are happy with the education that, they're get, that their kids are getting in, at Pinkerton. And I think for the most part, the families in Derry are very happy about the education that they get for their kids through K through eight as well. Um, so that's just, uh, yeah, any insights or any additional information you guys can share, uh, I'd love to hear that. Um, I'm also probably not always the greatest at acting this way, but um, I, I do think uh, you track more honeys, or sorry, you track more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. Um, so I do think, again, uh, having a person like Jacob Labrota here as a Pinkerton liaison, getting more students in here, inviting teachers here, um, if we are able to build momentum on those side of things, it will be abundantly easier on the contract side and the trustee side as well. So um, just a, 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 maybe a differing viewpoint than maybe some of the things that I you're I have here. one thought. Go ahead. You're dealing with the Board of Trustees. There's a big difference between Pinkin and Academy, its students, its faculty, its administration, as compared to the entity that runs the whole thing and really is focused very much on fiscal things. So I think that's what, when it comes to, there's been, uh, Derek talked about the relationships, but Mary Ann has an excellent relationship with, not just with the headmaster, but uh, others throughout. And, and um, it, there's, that's the difference that, that I think we're running into. Pinkerton is a great school and has great people and so forth. And Board of Trustees take some responsibility for Pinkerton being a great school. But I think that's, that's you gotta separate those two. Pinkerton's a good school and kids, the, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. That's why we have Next and that's why we do have some kids go elsewhere and so forth. But um, the people that are working there on a day-to-day -day basis care about the kids and they're, they're great people. I think sometimes we're just butting head when, when it gets down to monies and, and, and the Board of Trustees wanting to have that control over what's going on. That would be my thought. And so what I hear you asking, Jonathan, maybe it's 10 o'clock, but I'm usually doing work by then, so I'm pretty awake at 10. This is my natural time, um, is something different. I hear you asking, is the you know, is there a meshing of curriculum, right? And of our, you know, celebrating our strengths and also acknowledging our need, our areas in need of improvement. Um, we used to do things differently, you know, when we had um, different deans at Pinkerton and, and that's morphed over time. Practices have become more refined and more, refi more efficient. We used to sit down with huge spreadsheets and it used to take days um, when I was assistant superintendent, I was involved in every single meeting, as were our middle school principals. Um, so we used to do that for, you know, in, in find trends. Were we great and were we not so great? Bring those trends back to our principals and bring those back to our um, curriculum leaders and our content area specialists and say, okay, this is where we need to improve. And then how are we going to do that? This is not just where we need to improve, but how are we going to do that? Strategic planning. Um, we still do that. We just do it in a more refined level. Austin and now Joe will be in charge of that. 
Um, you know, our, we have now, we, we didn't have a director of literacy and a director of mathematics then. It was me. Now we have, we had content area specialists who were our teachers. So now we have um, multi layers of personnel who can implement that. It all boils down to communication and the time allotment. Pinkerton has more layers now, too. I'll take, for instance, Derek Lee. He's one of the deans, he is the dean of curriculum over there, and, and he works very closely with our director of um, grants management, Kim Conant, who you saw tonight. Derek's in our office a lot. So there is a constant collaboration. Can things, can systems always improve? Like I said tonight, absolutely. I do think we have that discourse going back and forth, acknowledging what we can do better, but also acknowledging what we do well. We also, um, you know, communicate and collaborate about what our sending towns are doing well and how we can learn from them. That happens in our sending school principal meetings. You know, they're, they're a think tank, what I call a think tank, and, and those are the best meetings we have, as are our sending superintendent meetings. They're kind of a different think tank, not so much about curriculum, but about practices and about, you know, what's changed at Pinkerton, and then how, how do we communicate that back to our board, how do we communicate back, that back to our administrative leaders, and then how did that happen? For instance, dress code policy, how did that happen? How did that change happen? So how can we take that back here? So I do think good things are happening. It's just making sure that that's communicated and we learn from one another and we're open-minded. So we have a very, as you, as you already mentioned, Derek, we have an extremely strong relationship between our administration. Um, inherent in that is curriculum, for sure. Its curriculum is grounded. Um, yet we also learn from other sending towns. So I think parents, can, parents, guardians, families can be assured that that's happening. Sometimes the results aren't seen so immediately, and that's sometimes that sense of urgency, it, it's there, yet it will be shown over time, I believe, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, <clears throat> that the uh, the frustration that that uh, we have in terms of uh, the fiscal planning for the year when we plan our budget, um, and, and and Bruce he, he can he's acutely aware of this is that let's just say for purposes of illustration we have a hundred million dollars for a budget, and I'm just going to use round round numbers, um, and. The amount of money that we have to allocate for Pinkerton Academy is preset because they've sent us what our tuition um, bill is going to be for the year. So we decide we need to cut six million dollars. That six million dollars cannot be spread over the entire budget. That six million dollars can only be spread over K through eight. So K through eight takes a disproportionate hit of the cuts of our whole budget. And if we knew and had some degree of control over the long-term planning of 9 through 12, we may be able to make some other accommodations and plan um, for long-term over a period of three or four years, like we try to do with the improvements and facilities improvements and things um, in the district now. But our hands are tied as far as that's concerned. So this isn't a power play, I don't think, where um, we want to, you know, hold our, you know, cross our arms and hold our breath like little kids. This is simply a matter of not only trying to accommodate the educational needs of students, but it's also a matter of good physical planning in terms of uh, uh, getting our, our money's worth um, and looking out for the, for the, getting the bang for the buck for taxpayers, too. And um, that's, I think that people need to understand that, so. If no one else has any more things to say, we will move on to committees and manifest approval. I move to approve the manifests in the total amount of 5,308,000 $339.98. General payroll consisting of $4,563,137.50 and general expenses of $745,202.48. Any 
Second. First by John, second by Derek. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. So we are now on to delegations and individuals. If this meeting has proved nothing, it proves that we do listen to everyone that speaks. But I would ask that if people do have thoughts, they do keep them brief, because it is after 10 p.m. And as much as we want to hear from you, it is after 10 p.m. So with that, does anyone have anything else they want to add that was not on one of the agenda items that we already discussed? I'll be quick. I really, I promise. So Butch Tepe Bowers Road. Uh, last year, I had asked about whether or not the facility master plan would include security upgrades. Uh, I was told the answer was no, uh, because we already did some upgrades that were part of a grant from a few years ago. Um, now tonight, Jane talks about applying for funding for um, a grant for potential security upgrades. So do we need the upgrades? Do we not need the upgrades? And if we do, which I personally am all for upgrades, um, why are we waiting until there's free money in order to do upgrades? If we need the upgrades now, and we think we need the upgrades now, and that's why we're doing the fund, we're putting in for the funding, what changed in really the last year? So that's kind of where I am on that. So I don't need any feedback, it's fine. Can I make a suggestion? So I don't want to put you off, but security has always been a really careful and um, not public discussion mm -hmm. because it keeps our kids safe. Mm -hmm. But I think if you made an appointment, and I, I know that doesn't sound really great, but find a time that Jane can sit and talk to you, Jane and Jeremy can talk to you about what we have uh, or what they can share with you um, and what they see the needs are, it probably would be a bit, and I don't mean to step on your toes, but like this is one of those things that is always in my head from listening to Homeland Security about mm -hmm. the best way to process things. Is that okay with you? No, no, I, I totally agree. I, I mean, 22 years in the security field, I know that there's certain things you just do not talk about, there's certain details. I, 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 I completely understand that, and Eric and I had a quick conversation before the meeting. Um, but just my concern is, you know, just a few months ago, we, uh, the answer was no, we're not going to do, we don't need upgrades because we already did upgrades, but now all of a sudden we, we, we need upgrades. So it's just, it, it, it just paints a, a picture of, to me, that, you know, we're only doing upgrades because there's free money. So that's just perception. So for the quick answer in the interest of time, uh, any time that there is, a, the uh, upgrades that we were referring to were the lobby renovations, which was about a million dollars for that project. Um, so that, that is not something that we would have been looking at to redo. Um, but we are continually, both Jeremy, myself, other people who work on safety in our district, we're cur constantly assessing security changes, upgrades, and as needed, I buy them um, when I need to. Uh, but of course, any time in addition that grant money is be going to become available, I, of course, in behalf of Derry, I'm going to apply, apply for anything that's free or given to the district. Um, but I, there, I, I certainly don't overlook or upgrade or make sure that we are as safe as possible um, just because I'm not publicly saying that we have or don't have funds. Um, I always find funds when things need to be taken care of for safety. But I'm happy to meet with you um, outside of the meeting as well, Butch. Thank you for the question. Good evening, Richard Tripp, 44 Wyndham Road. You might have noticed I came up, so it wouldn't take me half a minute to get here. <laughs> uh, the, uh, one of the things that we talked about tonight, it was on the agenda, was uh, the facility maintenance plan. Uh, that wasn't an attachment to this meeting. So is this something that uh, will eventually make its way to the website? It is an attachment in the, it was an attachment in the board agenda. Well, it's not on the one that was on the website. Um, well, it's in the packet under. Well, just it, because it's in the packet doesn't mean that we Sorry, I, I'm, I'm not sure, um, but we'll put Next it up on the, website. on the website. What? We'll put it up tomorrow if it's not on, if it's not with that. Good. Uh, I have another question. It was interesting that uh, we spent probably an hour talking about the schedule. The, uh, do you need all seven people here for a quorum? The answer is no, by the way. 
Uh, you might have wanted to take that into consideration when you were killing an hour of my life. Uh, Richard, Richard, it was 20 minutes, and I made the request. <laughs> I want to be at the facilities workshop. I made the request to switch the dates. Okay. Uh, I guess you spoke about the, the facility workshops at the last meeting, which I wasn't here, I think. I don't know. Uh, this is going to be not a during the week at 9 o'clock in the SAU building. This is going to be... They are going to be at the same time as school board meetings in the evening. Okay. So we're going to be having the facility workshop with the school board meetings? No, they're okay. going to be separate. You can come and watch, right. but they're workshops where they're working meetings. Uh, as, as usually happens, I learned a lot tonight. Uh, the uh, one thing that we can have uh, plans on what to do with the, uh, the state aid, we, it can be amended. I like that idea. Did you guys know that? No. Uh, placeholder applications. That's another thing I learned tonight. Uh, do these require board approval if, if you're going to submit one? Oh, we don't know. All right, and this has been a discussion wandering around for a while. Richard, you are down to about 15 seconds. Okay. I am keeping to the three minutes because it is after 10 o'clock. Does a roof replacement on the schools count as a renovation? It does count as a renovation, but it does not qualify for school building aid. Would it, if, since you are renovating a school, does that mean that you have to bring the rest of the school up to code? Do you mean if we replace a roof, would we have to? Well, we have we have this list of, of problems with each of the, with the, each of the schools, and I, and I was told that if you start fixing these issues, then you've no longer grandfathered and you have to bring the buildings up to code. So if a roof replacement is a renovation, does that mean that you have to fix the rest of the problems in the individual schools to bring them up to code? I'd, I'd have to check on that. I don't have Richard, I think to we're going to have to pause this discussion for another meeting. It's past Thank my you. Bedtime. there anyone else that would like to address the board if not i will welcome a motion to adjourn motion to adjourn. Whoa, 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 whoa. other business <laughs> we, we, we moved other business to the front do you have other, other i just business? have one thing okay. to say because this is marianne's last meeting and i can't oh, yeah, i can't just let it go oh well you asked for a motion to adjourn <laughs> um, and i'm going to make it really brief i was thinking today actually i heard a quote and i'm going to give it to you in a minute but I was thinking as I, when I heard this quote a couple weeks ago about your time here and um, how I've known you, when we lost assistant principals in our budget, that's when I first knew you. I didn't know you, but I knew of you um, because a friend of mine and I wrote a petition to keep you and the <laughs> assistant principal at East Derry because we had lots of children and we needed extra help. Um, so your, your trajectory here has been from a teacher all the way to where you are as a superintendent. So I heard um, retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann speak, and if you've never heard, him, heard of him or know of him, you should look him up. He's a US, U.S. Army Green Beret. He is the Pineapple Express leader, and it's quite a story. I won't go into it, but please look it up. So his quote was, when it looks like no one is coming, that is when leadership is most important. I think that identifies you very well, especially over the past two years. Not, not to discount your other years here, but the past two years, um, you put the right teams together and got us through a lot of really difficult times. So for all your years here, thank you. And I'll leave you with that quote. Thank you, Brenda. Appreciate that. So what I should have said before I asked a motion to adjourn is that this is a special meeting, a night unlike others. I'm Jewish, so Passover is how I think of it. But I'm going to say it's a night unlike others because whenever we have a change of leadership and it's moving towards that, it's a time to reflect on who set the, who set the groundwork for what's coming next and what they gave and remember what they gave as you move forward and reflect on them 
and look, look to them for advice even when they're not there. And there's a lot of things we're gonna be thinking about that Marianne advised us on when we're not here, even though she's not physically here to give advice. So thank you in advance. And with that, I would actually welcome a motion to adjourn. I'll restate my motion to adjourn. <laughs> in a sec, a first by John and a second by Jessica. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you.